I heard her. I come from the kitchen. All right. Now you're ready to start live. Oh, live. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It hasn't. It's hold on. Give it a second. Okay, it started. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the committee meeting of the school district of the city of York. We'll be starting with our educational program committee, director um, Michael Breland. Thank you, Madam President. That's time we'll do call to order to this meeting with myself, chair and all committee members present. And at this time, we will have a presentation from Ms. Lulu Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Breland. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our attorney, Allison Peterson, and she will be providing the presentation for this evening with an update to the status of Lincoln Charter School. Allison? Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Good evening. Yes. Good Excellent. evening. Good evening. It's nice to join you this evening. Um, I believe there's a PowerPoint presentation that is to be broadcast. There we go. Perfect. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So Ms. Thomas and Dr. Barry, uh, go one slide back, please, uh, are coming to you tonight and they asked me to be involved in the presentation of this information uh, that's being given tonight uh, to give you an overview of the pending renewal application for Lincoln Charter School, uh, to give you some information about an amendment request that is currently pending from Lincoln Charter School, and to give you information about the administration's position and recommendation on those two items tonight. Uh, I know that many of the board members were not on the board several years ago when the Lincoln Matters last came up for review, both with respect to the renewal um, in 2015, as well as some events that happened after that. So before we get into where we currently are today, we thought it would be important to give the board, uh, the totality of the board, some history here as to the events and the um, information that's relative to Lincoln. Um, Lincoln first received a charter in 2000. Uh, that was a charter that went through a lot of litigation uh, with the school district and then up to the state charter school appeal board, ultimately with the appeal board granting a charter in that year 2000. And Lincoln was at the time and currently remains the only conversion charter school in Pennsylvania. That is a term of art under the charter school law where a, a charter school started out as an existing public school under the authority of a school district and more than, or at least 50% of its employees and parents want to and opt to go through the conversion process to convert that existing public school into a public charter school. Um, as I stated, Lincoln holds the honor of being the only such school in Pennsylvania. Um, it has been uh, now through the renewal process. I believe this will be the fifth time or the, I guess I should say the fourth time that it's coming up for renewal. Uh, in Pennsylvania, renewals can be <coughs> only five years in length. Uh, they can't be fewer years in length or more years in length, only five. So in Lincoln's case, it came up for renewal in 2005, 2010, and 2015. Uh, it was renewed in each of those years. And the current charter term that is in the, the charter itself had a term end date of June 30th, 2020. Uh, obviously, we're sitting here and it's July 13th of 2020. That doesn't have any effect on... Lincoln's ability to operate, which I'll get to a few slides later, uh, but technically the charter term ends June 30th, 2020. I'm sure all of you know that Lincoln is located in the former Lincoln Elementary School, which is located at 559 West King Street. And that is a facility that is actually owned by York City School District by virtue of the conversion charter school process. 
Lincoln's current charter authorizes an enrollment of 785 total students in grades kindergarten through fifth grade. That I believe has been pretty static since the beginning. Lincoln has always uh, enrolled students in only kindergarten through fifth grade. Mr. Leonard Hart is currently the principal of Lincoln Charter School, that he is the highest ranking employee at the charter school. Uh, and as I stated before, Lincoln's last renewal was in 2015. At that time, after the comprehensive review process that is required under the charter school law, the school district administration had um, uh, gone through the process. It had flagged a few issues and concerns and as part of the charter that was uh, entered into at that time, there were a number of conditions that were included in that charter related to English learners, clearance and personnel file requirements, school safety audits, food service fund, um, some special education items, as well as there were some detailed academic performance targets and goals that were included in that charter uh, for Lincoln to uh, meet during the subsequent five years, which is leading up to the current time. Next slide, please. So um, every charter school in York City uh, goes through an annual review process. It is not as comprehensive as the renewal process. It's not intended to be under the law uh, or in practice, but things that happen every year that the, the school district administration does is it reviews the annual reports that are filed by the charter schools in New York, including Lincoln. It reviews annual academic data that is published typically by the state. It reviews documents as they come in. There are site visits that are generally conducted every year. Um, and there are you know, just things that happen on an annual basis. There's not a lot of back and forth between the charter school and the school district in that intervening time period, unless there are issues that are brought to the attention of the district or vice versa or things that come up. Um, so so there's, there typically isn't a lot of um, in-depth communications during that time period other than kind of standard annual back and forth. Um, in Lincoln's case, uh, in February of 2017, Lincoln did submit an amendment request uh, that was, I believe at that time, limited to adding the sixth grade. However, that request was subsequently withdrawn within a month or so of its submission. Uh, and if you could go to the next slide, please. I, one of the reasons, I, I won't speak for Lincoln, but at the same time as the amendment request was submitted, it was discovered that there was an issue with audits at Lincoln Charter School. And I'm just going through some, this so you have some background of the back and forth that's happened in the last few years. Um, around that same time frame, March of 2017, it came to the attention of the district that there were incomplete financial audits for several years at that point in time. Uh, at that, I believe it was 13, 14, 14, 15, and 15, 16 were late. And I guess actually 16, 17 would have been late at that point in time as well. Um, through com various communications with Lincoln, who was very forthcoming with information at the time, um, there was disclosed that there were issues when there was a conversion from management of Lincoln Charter School under the Edison School's thumb to Lincoln's own self-contained in-house management. And then there were issues getting records from Edison. And then there were issues with uh, prior administration making sure things were done in a timely manner, all of which led up to the problems with the audits and the audits not being completed in a timely way. Uh, lack of completion of audits is obviously a very uh, important and, and material concern. The district at that time took steps and had lengthy communications and discussions with Lincoln 
to make sure that those audits were ultimately completed, even though they were late. Um, Lincoln was able to complete all of the audits except for the 13-14 school year audit. Um, I believe from the things that the district was told that because of the missing records associated with that year, the auditors were not able to complete that audit. Um, however, the subsequent audits were all completed and now leading up to where we are sitting here today, Lincoln's most recent audit for the 18-19 school year was completed in a timely fashion. Um, under the leadership of Dr. Holmes at that time, it was determined that uh, the best situation was to uh, enter into and discuss a settlement agreement with Lincoln uh, to address the outstanding audits, putting conditions in place to make sure that that did not happen again, uh, and putting some other uh, conditions and terms in place to address some other issues that had come up relative and, and, and kind of hand in hand with the, the missing audit issues. So in June of 2019, there was a settlement agreement that was entered into between the parties and to address those types of issues. So that is the background that now leads us up, if we could go to the next slide, to where the parties are today. In the renewal year, and that's defined as basically the last year of a charter school's charter, the charter school law, specifically section 1728, requires the authorizing school district, York City School District in this case, to perform a comprehensive review of that charter school's performance and operations prior to deciding if a five-year renewal of the charter is warranted. Uh, your school board policy 140 has supplemented the requirements of the charter school law. Specifically, it has put in place some renewal guidelines, um, a renewal application template that all charter schools must submit uh, by October 31st of their renewal year. Uh, there are some provisions within the renewal guides, guidelines talking about the district's attempts to conduct site visits as part of that renewal review, um, and also talking about, you know, having some dialogue between the school district and the charter school as part of that review process. Next slide. So in terms specifically for Lincoln, this slide provides some information about what has happened over the course of the last year relative to the review. So Lincoln submitted the renewal application in October of 2019 per the policy. Uh, York City administration conducted a site visit to Lincoln on October 17th. There was supposed to be a second site visit that would have been conducted in the spring, which I believe is, is the administration standard practice. Unfortunately, when the school closures occurred, that site visit could, could not occur. Um, different offices within the school district administration have been involved throughout the renewal process. They have been reviewing the submissions that the charter school has made to the school district. They have been reviewing other information that is publicly available, such as academic performance data, um, data that's available on the different Pennsylvania Department of Education sites for safe schools, for example, um, other information that has come into the district as, as part of the renewal process. Um, after reviewing what was publicly available and also provided in the renewal application, uh, the school district administration made two additional information requests to ask for some clarifying data um, and ask some clarifying questions. Those two re information requests occurred in December of 2019 and then later in April in the middle of the school closure process. Um, Following the review of all of that data, the York City administration met virtually with various representatives from Lincoln Charter School and that visit, I'm sorry, that meeting occurred, I believe on June 11th. To 
to give the board just an, kind of a quick overview and an idea of the depth uh, and breadth of the, the review process, there were, I believe, over three or 4,000 pages of documents that have been reviewed. Uh, they include some of the, the items that I'm, I say here, the, certainly all of the charter documents, the annual reports that Lincoln has submitted to the district, uh, Lincoln's charter board of trustees meeting minutes, which are publicly available on Lincoln's website which was a requirement under the, the 2015 charter so that those are accessible for everyone. Um, bylaws, conflict of interest policies, other policies that Lincoln has in place, Lincoln's code of conduct and, and information that's provided to student and parents, the available financial audits, uh, the general ledger, vendor contracts from a business perspective, uh, from a school safety perspective, the district administration uh, has reviewed the school, the safe schools reports, the memorandums of understanding that are entered into with the local police, uh, the SHARS reports, which is an acronym that refers to the Department of Health's submission process related to school health services, fire drill documentation, personnel related information like clearances and certifications, uh, governance related documents, statements of financial interest, uh, different reports that have been put out, um, the academic performance information that's available, and, and many other types of documents, uh, not all of which are stated here. So there are different components to the renewal review, I'll, I'll call them buckets for lack of a better word, that the different data points and information that I just described fall into. One of the biggest buckets is academic performance. Um, and when the school district is reviewing a charter school's academic performance, it's looking back to the performance over the last five years of the charter term um, if you know anything about the way the state accountability system works, most of the information is on a one-year lag. So even though we're sitting here and it, we're, we're at the end of the 2019-2020 school year and, and now in the 2021 school year, we don't we wouldn't normally have data from the state for the 1920 school year until the, the fall of the following year. In this particular case, because there were no PSSA tests that were administered in the spring of 2020, we wouldn't have that data anyway. So basically we're looking back as far as we can over that five year period. Um, the chart that's currently in the PowerPoint, I wanna highlight a few things. So again, if you are familiar with the state assessment system um, and, and PSSAs in particular, then you are aware that the, in the 2014, 2015 school years, the state revamped the PSSA chest and changed the standards to which it was aligned. Um, that caused the state testing results um, statewide, not just in, in New York or not specific to Lincoln, but the statewide testing results to drop rather substantially from the PSSA results in prior school years. So many people do not like to compare the state test scores for prior years uh, from 2014-15 to 14-15 and beyond. We're not doing that in this case because our five-year look back really only begins with the 14-15 school year, but I wanted to flag that for your attention. Um, because of that change in the way the assessments were done, there's less information for the 14-15 school year available because the state did not issue a school performance profile for that year. 
So if you look in the column for 14, 15, you'll see that there's not as much information there. And that's because it's, it was simply not available at that time. Um, because Lincoln enrolls students in grades kindergarten through fifth grade, the data points that are available are uh, reflective of PSSA performance in grades three through five. Um, this, the data that appears on this table is data points that are consistent with the case law from the State Charter School Appeal Board and the appellate courts in Pennsylvania related to charter school performance requirements academically. So the data that's being reported out here is, 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 is kind of what you would look at to determine if what type of performance a charter school is having. So when you look at Lincoln's data, you see that there are inconsistencies with the school performance profile score, which is also known as the ACT 82 score. Um, it, that is still being calculated in Pennsylvania for all public schools, including charter schools, uh, because of its uh, effect on the educator performance and, and accountability system. So we still have that data. The second row, really the second, third, fourth, and fifth rows in this table are reporting out the percentage of students who scored proficient or advanced on the PSSA uh, ag in the aggregate grades three to five in those respective years. So if you look at the math data, you will see that it initially, the scores initially went up in those first two years, and then there has been a decline in math since the 15-16 school year. In English language arts, you have um, inconsistencies. It's, you know, within four percentage points or so of the scores, but it's inconsistently going up and down each year. In science, uh, that is a grade four science only. Um, science is a tested grade in grades four and eight. Lincoln does not have grade eight, so this is reflective of grade four only. Um, you see some large gains in 15, 16, a big drop in 16, 17, a gain again in 17, 18, and then a drop again in 18, 19. So inconsistencies in those test scores. And then the third, and then the grade three English language arts is an indicator that PDE reports out uh, in the future ready index. And again, you see uh, decreases in that grade three ELA score from an opening percentage of 41.3 down to the last reported school year of 21.5. Um, the the other rows with the indicators of closing the achievement gap, that was a measurement that was used under the school performance profile system when that data was reported out. That data has not been um, included in the future ready index, but we thought you would be interested in seeing that data. Um, a, a score of 100 was an indicator of all students being moved to close the achievement gap, at least within that measured cohort. A score of zero reflects no students being moved towards the closure of the achievement gap. Uh, the, a school would seek a score of, or would want a score of 100 and not a score of zero. And then finally, the last three rows reflect um, PVAS, which is a growth measurement. I'm sure you are familiar with that term, but it's, met, it's Pennsylvania Va Value Added Assessment System. It's measuring how much growth a student makes in a year and whether the student has met the Pennsylvania growth standard to make at least one year's worth of growth. A score of 50 is the lowest score you can get. It's an indicator, it's indicated in red, both here and on the PVAS data system. Um, 
that's not that would show that students are not meeting the Pennsylvania growth standard and that there are there is significant evidence that that is the case. A score of 100, however, is the opposite. It is the highest score you can receive and it shows that students are making growth. Uh, as the, the data shows here, um, in the 16-17 school year, Lincoln had, there were some struggles at Lincoln that year. I think all of the data reflects that in terms of scores going down and, and students not making growth. The other school years uh, are, are trend much better. Um, and they do show that students at Lincoln were, were making at least one year's worth of growth, even if they were not on grade level, uh, and that there was evidence of that uh, in those other subject areas. Next slide, please. This is just, this slide here with the graph just is a different way to look at the data. Um, and it's specific to that PSSA performance data. Uh, of students scoring proficient or advanced. So you can see in math, which is the blue line, that there's not a lot of fluctuation, but there's also not really improvement after the 15, 16 year and in the performance uh, percentages. In uh, English language arts, the trend is virtually the same. It's, it's a slight downward trend, but really not much fluctuation and not any improvement. Um, the third grade ELA is the purple, and that is obviously showing the downward trend that the numbers reflected in the previous uh, data chart. And then the green uh, fluctuating line is, is that fourth grade science. Related to the academic performance, um, not only does the district evaluate all charter schools against the standards that have been set by the appellate courts, which is why we went through the endeavor that I just talked about, looking at the fluctuations and, and whether there was improvement in proficiency, as well as looking at the PVAS and all of that. But in this case, we ha Lincoln has a current charter that includes academic goals. I stated that before. In that charter, the expectation was that um, there would be increases in proficiency percentages uh, in each year and in both ELA, English language arts and math. Um, there was a kind of a, a straight line 4.48 percentage points expectation each year so that over the course of the charter term, the expectation was that um, proficiency percentages would grow by uh, approximately 20 to 25 percent. That, again, that's in English language arts. Similar, similarly, in math, the expectation was a 3.38 percentage point growth per year um, with the expectation that over the five-year term, the increase would be upwards and close to 20%. As the data shows, neither of those goals were met. Um, there was if really not any, any year in English language arts that that percentage point uh, goal was met. Um, it was met in only two of four years in math. Uh, another academic goal in Lincoln's charter was improvement in the school performance profile score each year. That was not met. And then in the PVAS growth standard, the, that was a, a separate goal and as we went through the data, that was met in each year, except for the 2016-2017 school year. One of the other buckets uh, that the administration and, and school districts look at when they go through the renewal process is the financial health of the charter school and the sustainability, uh, making sure the charter school is, is in a good financial position, uh, to be a sustainable entity going forward. 
So there are a lot of different things that go into that type of review. Certainly the independent audits are the, the main starting point to see what the auditors of the charter school are saying about it. Um, in this case, the last audit for 1819 that is currently available um, showed that, that this charter school did have a, what I'll call a healthy fund balance as of June 30th, 2019 as at almost $5 million. Um, there was no evidence that the charter school was behind in paying its creditors or its employees in a timely way. No evidence that payments to piecers, for example, were not made in a timely way. Uh, the charter school does not currently have any long-term debt that, that at least the school district is aware of. Um, notably, the charter school does not own its facility, the school district does. So it is, um, it, it is in that facility based upon a lease agreement. And so the charter school is paying rent to the school district on a monthly basis, basically, or, or every year. Um, there was a long-term debt to Edison Schools, which is the former management company, but that was finally resolved in February of 2018 and is no longer on the books of the school. And, and Lincoln no longer has a management company. There was an, uh, an issue, a related issue to the failure to, to timely complete the audits for Lincoln. That if, and be, because Lincoln didn't complete the audits, its auditors and accountants couldn't file the Form 990s that all nonprofit or, or all 501c3 tax exempt organizations have to file each year. Because the 990s were not filed, Lincoln Charter School actually lost its tax exempt status um, several years ago. However, that has now been reinstated by the Internal Revenue Service as of April of 2020, because the 990s have now been filed um, for, for the time period that the IRS required. Lincoln also has appropriate insurance in place based upon the review that was conducted, and there have not been any Auditor General opinions issued for Lincoln. That is, that's just something else we look at as part of the renewal process. The third big bucket um, is kind of everything else. Uh, it, it's, it's the compliance with all of the other applicable legal requirements that charter schools must meet, which are many of which are very similar to what the school district has, has to meet. Um, and they fall within several subcategories. One is student health and safety. So as I said, we, the district was looking at the MOUs that are in place, the safe schools reports, the fire drill, school health screenings, making sure that they're in compliance. Um, for the most part, everything that was reviewed in that regard was compliant. There was, however, um, various discrepancies that were noted in the safe schools reports that are um, submitted to the state and published online so that anyone can go on and see how many um, suspensions or expulsions a public school has, the type of offenses that students are engaging in, um, the disciplinary consequences for those actions, um, truancy data, absence data, etc. cetera. Um, when the district reviewed the Safe for Schools reports filed by Lincoln, it became very clear that there was data that was missing from those reports, that they were not accurate, that there was inconsistent data reported year to year. And um, we that was discussed with Lincoln as part of the meeting that was held. And um, I, I think it's safe to say that Lincoln agreed that there were either omissions in those documents or inaccurate data that was filed in those documents and that that um, needed to be rectified and, the, and that the people who were conducting that data submission need to address that going forward uh, in a way to make sure that that data is consistent. So that, that was an issue that was flagged. Um, another issue that was 
flagged was related to uh, a program that that Lincoln was operating that was, I believe, in, instituted in 2018-2019 school year called the Twilight Program. And um, I'm going to use the terms restorative, that it's a restorative type of program for um, disciplinary reactions or, or, or in lieu of discipline program. And there was, uh, in the administration's estimate, lack of clarity uh, and, and documentation over how that program was being implemented, what parents were being told about it to make sure that parents were given due process rights, things of that nature. It's, and it, that's more it, it's an issue in the messaging piece of it, what's down on in paper in the student handbook and code of conduct about it and that sort of thing. So there was a lot of discussion among the administration and Lincoln over that program and how that could be better um, messaged and, and communicated with parents and stakeholders in the future. Um, there was also a note about the code of conduct, not specifically informing parents or students about what due process procedures are available for special ed students who might be facing discipline. Um, there was due process procedures noted for students who are not special ed students that comply with chapter 12, but the specific special ed requirements were not in there. With respect to enrollment materials, there was some questions um, raised regarding what information is required of students and parents before a student applied for enrollment versus enrollment versus what can be required to enroll versus simply requested. So there are, is case uh, statutory requirements in Pennsylvania that limit what can actually be required before you can enroll a student. So there's some, some clarity that needs to be provided in those enrollment materials. Um, English learner services were reviewed. Uh, the, the charter school appears to have updated procedures and policies that have been put in place. So that's a, that's a positive. Um, there was an issue or a concern initially noted about the percentage of students who were actually given the access test, which is the language development exam that the state mandates uh, every English learner take annually. Um, but there were uh, reasons that Lincoln provided for why particular students did not take the test due to early withdrawals, due to um, kind of inaccurate data in, in the initial data that was provided. So, so there was some, dis some discussion about that. Next slide, please. Another um, area, special ed, there are, Lincoln has procedures and policies that are in place they have um, not had a Bureau of Special Ed compliance report since 2015, 2016, but that report did not raise any compliance issues and there was no other evidence of non-compliance uh, with respect to special education requirements in the files that district administration reviewed and in their discussions with Lincoln staff. From a personnel perspective, um, staff certifications appeared to be in compliance with the charter school law, which mandates that at least 75% of professional staff have appropriate um, state certifications for the positions and that they are in and the subjects they are teaching. Um, that was reviewed. There were not issues with that that were found. Um, clearance issues were also found uh, when we had gone through some of the, the, the review that occurred in 2018, those issues, as far as the administration could tell, have been addressed by Lincoln. Um, governance, statements of financial interest were in order. The annual reports were filed in a timely manner. I noted before that the charter uh, board meeting minutes are posted on Lincoln's website, which is a requirement of the charter and that the board meetings and the composition of the board itself 
appear to comply with the bylaw requirements. There was an issue uh, identified related to the format of the meeting minutes themselves because it was not clear due to board uh, vacancies or due to board turnover who was on the board at that particular time versus who was present at board meetings. And that would be necessary to determine a quorum. It did not appear that there was non-compliance with the quorum rules. It just was suggested that those board meeting minutes need to have more accurate information reported so that, that the public was aware of that, as was the school district. And then the last um, piece that's on this slide uh, reflects a survey. Under the 2015 charter, the uh, Lincoln was required to conduct a survey of its community stakeholders. And there were some specific surveys that were required to be utilized. Um, those surveys were not utilized, although apparently at least one of them is no longer available. A substitute survey was utilized by Lincoln. So there was a survey conducted, but there was a very small number of responses that were provided to the school district uh, reflective of, of the input, input for the purpose of the survey. Um, I, in the, my opening comments, I mentioned an amendment request. Um, in the fall, Lincoln submitted an, an amendment request to the school district that the school district has, uh, administration has been reviewing part and parcel to the renewal review. The, the amendment request is essentially seeking three different changes, uh, which, which I believe are all material changes to the charter. The first change is an increase in the enrollment. Uh, as I noted before, the current charter permits Lincoln to enroll a total of 785 students. Uh, and that's total enrollment, not just enrollment from York City School District. Lincoln uh, in the amendment request is actually seeking to increase that enrollment to up to 875 students by the third year of what would be the renewal charter um, and then continue with that thereafter. Um, I note here they say or alternatively stated as seeking 785 York City School District students. That is a what I'll call newer request that has come in as, as recently as last week, at the end of last week, where that was something that they were seeking as a change in the current charter language. So instead of 785 total seats, it's 785 York City student seats. And if you look at the bottom bullet point, that can give you some, just some perspective of what the current enrollment numbers are uh, as a K-5 school. There are currently, or at least as of May, 636 students enrolled, total students enrolled at Lincoln, 563 of whom are York City residents. Um, the second, change that Lincoln seeks through the amendment request is the addition of what I'll call middle school grades, six, seven, and eight. My believe that the, the um, proposal was to phase those grades in one year at a time, starting with the current school year grade six, and then adding a grade each year. Um, and then the third change that was requested in the amendment request is the addition of a second location at 459 West King Street. Um, just to give you context from the address that that is the former site of New Hope Academy Charter School. I believe that Lincoln is seeking to enter into a lease with the owner uh, or landlord of that facility to offer additional um, services and educational components there, as well as to move the middle school grades, and I believe also grade five 
to that second location should the amendment request be granted. You know, the next slide, please. Um, again, for context, I think it's important that the board um, know what the current state of the law is on amendment requests. Um, there was a important case that was decided by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in August of 2017 called Discovery Charter School versus the Philadelphia School District. Uh, that was a case where Discovery was seeking an amendment to its existing charter to raise the enrollment cap and to operate out of a bigger facility that they were building. And Philadelphia did not grant that request. Um, Discovery Charter School objected. They um, filed litigation and an appeal trying to um, force the district to uh, amend their charter. And ultimately the case made its way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court actually reversed uh, a long line of existing appellate cases and the Supreme Court found that the charter school law does not provide for amendments to charter. That the chartering school district has the authority and discretion to consider amendment requests uh, and, and, and again, does so in its discretion. It is not required to act on amendment requests and a charter school does not have a property interest in an amendment request because they're seeking something, they don't yet have it. The Supreme Court also gave instruction that if a charter school cannot um, reach an agreement, so to speak, with a school district as the authorizer on an amendment request, then the, a remedy for the charter school is to file a new charter school application if, if the charter school wants to materially modify the terms of its charter. So that information is just provided to you as background so you kind of understand the procedural um, posture of the amendment request that's currently pending in front of you. Um, at, at this time, I want to talk a little bit about the recommendations that Dr. Barry and Ms. Thomas and the administration and cabinet are making to the board, um, kind of on, on where this case might move or where the situation might move forward, um, putting the decision ultimately in front of the board because it is the school board's decision to make. Um, on the amendment request, the administration is not recommending that the amendment request be granted. And there are several reasons for that. I'm gonna highlight, I, I think probably the four biggest reasons here, um, most material reasons. And the first reason is that the amendment request that's been submitted is not consistent with the charter application that was originally filed for Lincoln proposing to be a conversion charter school. Um, and, and that application was specific for offering a, a kindergarten through fifth grade program and did not speak to offering a middle school component. Um, and notably, if, if folks are familiar with um, the last few years, or, or I think it was actually in 2009, there was a middle school component that had been granted to an affiliated entity called Lincoln Charter Middle School, which ended up doing business under the name of Helen Thaxton Charter School. Um, that charter school was from what the administration understands, the middle school component for Lincoln, kids coming out of Lincoln Charter School. Um, now that charter has since been revoked, 
but there at one time was a, a middle school component. Another material issue with the amendment request is that the educational programming that Lincoln submitted with the amendment request did not include a complete curriculum for those middle school grades that were proposed to be served. Uh, the educational plan that was submitted was, was very unclear uh, and indefinite as to what the curriculum would be and then also lacking in the actual curricular documents. And then finally, um, in terms of the academic performance that had been discussed previously, uh, the administration does not feel that the performance over the charter term warrants expansion at, at this time. What the administration is recommending related to the renewal, however, is a five-year renewal uh, with conditions for Lincoln. And the administration has informed Lincoln of that when, when the meeting occurred in June and has provided Lincoln with a proposed renewal charter. Um, and, and just again, for, for the new board members, just so you understand, normally, um, and normally, I mean, based on past practice, the administration would be coming to the board, having talked to the charter school up for renewal, um, having gone through a, a review and a negotiation process if, if there was a recommendation for a renewal and would typically be in a position to grant or, or to um, be presenting a renewal charter that had already been finalized uh, with language that had been approved by the charter school and presenting that to the school board here for approval. Uh, again, being recommended by the administration. We're not quite there yet at this point in time with Lincoln. A, a renewal charter has been presented to Lincoln. Um, the renewal charter that's been presented contains the same terms that are in the current charter, the 785 total students, the same grade structure K through five, the same location that Lincoln is currently operating at, uh, as well as some updated academic goals reflecting the, the, the data and the issues that were noted, as well as some additional provisions in that charter addressing some of the concerns that had, had come up as part of the review. That proposal was sent to Lincoln in June and Lincoln, um, I believe it was late Thursday night, like 11 o'clock at night, has now sent back some proposed revisions to that renewal charter. The, the administration is in the process of reviewing those changes and evaluating them. That has not been completed yet, but um, the administration wanted to give the board this update and be able to get you know, feedback from the board on those items um, to see if that changed any of the proposal or the recommendation. Uh, there is also um, a lease agreement that has been presented to Lincoln uh, because the lease between the district and Lincoln has not been updated since 2004. That was 16 years ago. Um, it is kind of unheard of in, in the, the land of lease agreements for a lease not to be updated for 16 years. And there is a lot of outdated information um, in that the current lease. So the parties desire, I think mutually desire to get that um, updated and reflective of current circumstances. Uh, we are, the, the new lease has been provided, new proposed lease has been provided to Lincoln and Lincoln is in the process of getting comments back to the district. 
Um, the one last thing I want to end with is that, as I stated, there there is nothing that's currently um, in front of the board on the agenda for approval at this time because the, the language has not yet been worked out. Um, I think everyone's goal is to try to have something in front of the board as soon as possible. But Lincoln's charter does not simply end simply because the term ended on June 30th. Um, by, there, there's case law on this issue and by operation of law, Lincoln's charter simply continues with the same terms and conditions um, until such time as it is either renewed with, with new language or until it is revoked or not renewed. And there's a whole legal process that goes along with that. That's not currently um, contemplated here at this time. So Lincoln's charter simply continues. So if there was any question about that, I want the board to be assured that that's the case. And I believe that is the end of the planned presentation here. So um, I'm sure the administration or I could field questions from the board. Okay, board members, if there are any other questions you may ask at this time. Um, this is um, board member um, Carmen Bryant. Um, when did the new um, principal take um, hold of the, um, the charter school? Um, I, I don't have the exact date, but I believe that Mr. Hart has been involved for several years now. Um, I, possibly 2016, but may, Ms. Thomas or, or Dr. Barry, do you know the answer to that? I don't know the exact date, uh, Carmen, um, but he's been there a while. It, it's been several years. And when will we get the data for the um, 1920 school year? Well, we won't get any testing data because there is none. Remember, we didn't have a we didn't have a test this year. Well, that's right. In the um, in the right. and uh, another question: um, Do we know why the lease was never updated for sixteen years? Um, I don't know that there has been a desire or, or a, an identified need by either party to update the lease. The, the rent, just so you know, the rent schedule that's in the lease is I think a 40 or 50 year term. So, so, okay. the, so, so, so the rent almost goes into what feels like perpetuity. <laughs> um, so, so that hasn't changed, but but there's a lot of terms in the lease that are no longer relevant or really reflective of the, the current relationship among the parties. Okay. I was surprised because I, you know, I, I was not aware that um, Lincoln Charter was um, actually operating as um, uh, Helen Thaxton. I, you know, I wasn't aware that. Aware well, that. Carmen, let, let me just be clear because that is that's not accurate. The, okay. There, there were there are there were two separate entities, and if I misspoke, I apologize. Okay. There were two separate nonprofit corporations. One is Lincoln Charter School, which was one entity, and then there was a separate nonprofit corporation created for Lincoln Charter Middle School, doing with and then ended up doing business as Helen Thaxton Charter School. At one point, they had the same board members, but they were two separate corporations. There was a lot of overlap in the services that were being provided by various staff members for both schools. That ultimately changed for a, a number of reasons, including concerns that the district had raised. But they were two separate entities, but they were related entities in that sense. That's okay. all I have right now. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Director Riviera. I have several questions. Uh, Allison, now under your impression, you're saying that uh, Lincoln Charter is paying rent. From what I, my uh, impression is that uh, York City's district owns this school. They pay us no rent, correct? Uh, and they also do not pay utilities. 
So what there's what I was told as a board member, we foot all of their bills. We foot their facility and their bills. They pay us nothing. Pay us nothing, let alone their taking away our children from our school district, which is also taking away money out of our school district. That's what we need to be thinking about as far as Lincoln Charter is concerned. They are doing a good job, but they are also affecting our pockets. We are a school district in need. And um, I feel as though if, I, I mean, if I can live somewhere and have it free, and have everybody pay my bills, I, I would be there also. I would want to, I would want a 40 to 50 year uh, contract too. So, uh, yeah. Is now, Mr. Snodgrass on the call? No, uh, this is David Diffendahl for Dick Snodgrass. Okay. Uh, then I got another question. The teachers at Lincoln Charter, are they actually teachers? Teachers, are they certified or just, you know I mean? Because are they required to have actual teachers or they just be uh, certified as a teacher? Our, our letter, this is Ms. Thomas. They are required to be certified teachers in the content area in which they provide instruction. Okay. Yes. They must and, be certified and, teachers. Just like we have to have certified teachers, they right. must be certified in their content area in which they are providing instruction. Yes, at, at least 75% of the professional staff. So that includes teachers, school nurses, guidance counselors, special education teachers, uh, English uh, learner, uh, Eng English as a second language teachers, principals, etc. Now, all of the special education staff, 100% must be appropriately certified, and all of the princil principals must be appropriately certified. So, okay. So, okay. Mr. Diefendahl, did you want to respond about the rent question? Absolutely. Director the, the district of, York, of the city of York pays the utilities and pays the repair and maintenance costs of Lincoln. And on a quarterly basis, that is billed to Lincoln. Pays the vendor. So it would be the utility companies. It would be York Water, York Sewer, and different uh, HVAC and mechanical contractors. That data is then captured and on a quarterly basis that is billed along with the quarterly rent. Uh, Mr. Differendorfer, you say it's billed toward Lincoln. It's billed to Lincoln. So tell me how much money is Lincoln actually paying York City School District per month? Well, that, it would, that would include their rent and their utilities. Uh, I'll come down to your office and talk to you about that tomorrow. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not... Okay. Mr. Diffidom, this is Mr. Breland. I couldn't hear a lot of your explanation for some reason. Uh, I'll get closer. So currently, it, it has been displayed. Yeah, your volume's not real clear because I, I can't hear you either. Yeah, Dave, you keep going in and out. Okay, let me get, is this better? Yes. Yes. So uh, my apologies for shoving my face in everyone's face. Um, so what ha the, the current process is the school district of the city of York pays the utilities and repairs and maintenance costs as they are incurred uh, at the Lincoln location at 559 West King Street. On a quarterly basis, the York City School District bills Lincoln for those costs that have been accumulated over the prior quarter. So for example, in July, we will build Lincoln Charter Lincoln Charter for the April, May, and June um, uh, quarter. So we bill them the rent, and then we bill them all the costs that have been accumulated for repairs and maintenance and, and facility uh, costs, including utilities. And, and the amount will vary. Uh, I, I don't have the rent number in front of me uh, at this time, but that's certainly an easy number to gather uh, for that. So there is, unfortunately, um, uh, we have asked Lincoln to pay their own way and the district not to be involved. And for they, they pay the, their utilities and their repairs and maintenance costs uh, directly to the vendor. And uh, it's in the agreement 
between the York City School District and Lincoln Charter that that's the process. Uh, so they are within their rights to reject our request. Um, we were just doing it to try to streamline and improve processes. Certainly it's not conducive for us to get in process and pay invoices and then, re and then re get reimbursement later on. But I will certainly uh, be happy to meet with you, Director Riviera, as your schedule allows. Just a follow-up question on that reimbursement payment. Are those reimbursements coming through in a timely manner? Yes, they pay, they pay promptly. Okay. Hi, this is President Sweeney. My question is, you already said, they already said that they have a new amendment, I mean, a new lease agreement. And that new lease agreement, did we think about um, changing them paying their own bills? Hello, Mr. Dippendorf? I, I was not part of those conversations, so I cannot comment to uh, uh, inclusion or exclusion of that. Um, I, I haven't seen the documents and I was not part of the discussions, so I can't comment to that. Could Ms. Thomas answer that question? I actually wasn't a part of the lease agreement conversations either, but we can reach out to um, um, Allison and to uh, also to Mr. Snodgrass to uh, get you a copy of the proposed, um, if there is a final proposal in terms of the lease. Yeah, and, and let me speak to that because uh, it, Mr. Snodgrass and I were the main people communicating about that and then sent that the proposal to Lincoln. Um, there, I don't have it open in front of me, so I don't wanna misspeak. I cannot recall exactly what the um, utility billing process and function, if, if that changed, there was a issue raised related to the capital improvement requirements and um, placing more of the burden or for funding those on Lincoln rather than the district in lieu of changing the rent structure. Because oftentimes what happens with leases as capital improvements come due, rent goes up because it's just a normal process as for a landlord tenant relationship um, as, as, as the parties recognize the, the light, useful life of, of functions of the building that that has to evolve over time. And the lease structure right now, the way it's written does not really recognize that. It's all based upon the initial cost, what was the bond structure at the existing time. So the the provisions that have been added address mainly those those capital improvement responsibilities and and who they fall on um i would have to double check the utility function because i don't know if mr snodgrass flagged that when we did the initial review of the lease um in terms of where we are as i said we had presented the, the, we meaning the administration had presented um, a new lease proposal to Lincoln. I was told on Thursday evening that um, Lincoln is in the process of getting their comments on that proposal to the district, but we have not received that yet. Okay, we this can... is Director Riviera again. Um, regarding the lease, here we go. I just wanna make a comment. I want us as board members as the New York City School District to think, are we thinking common sense? Are we thinking business sense? Are we thinking no sense? How do you want your school district to flow? Do you want it to flow commonly? Do you want it to flow businessly? Or do you want it to go down the drain? Figure this out, because we can't keep footing everybody's bills. You gotta understand that. You gotta understand that we can't keep footing everybody's bills. Remember that, because if everybody can foot everybody's bills, somebody come over here and foot mine. I'm in agreement with you, Thank you, Director Riviera. I believe too that we need to take a look at that and look at what's more what's feasible for the district as well as the charter school. But I don't believe that after 20 years, we're stuck at the same spot with no increases or even yes, taking a look at that. 
Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, so this is President Sweeney. I'm totally in agree with uh, Director Riviera and Breland. Um, we really must look at this. As, and since we are writing up a new lease, we should keep that in mind. Mr. Differentdorf said that he tried to speak to them on that, but because it was in the, the provision was already in the lease, there was nothing that we could do. While we're writing up a new lease, let's make sure we take care of that before we okay it, if at all possible. This is Director Brown. I just had a couple of questions regarding the um, proposed expansion. Did, um, I'm looking where, Okay, they want 90 more uh, students, but not all from, maybe I have it backwards, not all from the city of York or, or will they be coming from somewhere else? With the 875 number, the way it was presented was as a total enrollment figure, regardless of, of the resident school district. However, as I said, the, in the most recent proposal that we received last late last week, it's now 785 York City residents as as the new enrollment cap that they are proposing. Okay, and there there was no curriculum for those proposed grades for the expansion submitted. There, there was no detailed curricular plan and, and what um, the administration would call curriculum for those grades as the term curriculum has been articulated by the State Charter School Appeal Board. Okay, and- um, Director Brown, before you move on, I just wanted to add an additional mm -hmm. to that question that you asked in terms of the charter's process. Allison, am I correct that when they submit a charter they need to have the curricular information present? In, 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 a, in a new charter school application process, curriculum is one of the material areas of the review process where the State Charter School Appeal Board has um, been very clear that the curriculum must be detailed, must show evidence of standards alignment to all of the grades that are to be offered at least in the initial year of operation um, as and in all subject areas that they intend to offer to students. And expansion would fall under that qualification? Well, expansion as, as because of the Discovery Charter School case, there, there is no required amendment process. It's only with the permission of the charter authorizing school district. Um, but one would assume that it's, it's reasonable that the curriculum should be in place if they're seeking to expand into different grade levels. Thank you. Thank you, Director Brown. Okay. And um, I, guess, I guess my concern with all of that, with the, with the request, uh, is this for, I think this is twofold here, but is this for the school year starting next month, supposedly? Starting uh, 13 days ago. <laughs> Okay. Uh, that's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, see, I know we're talking about two different things here. We're talking about the renewal, the five-year renewal, and also the expansion. Yeah, you are correct that they okay. wanted the sixth grade to be added for the current 2020-2021 school year. Okay. I guess I, I wanted clarification on that. Thank you. And the, thank you for the presentation also. You're welcome. But let me get clarification if I'm correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. But if they're going to make this amendment, then aren't they going to have to uh, request a new charter? So they, I, I do not know um, what Lincoln intends to do. Again, we are in the process of trying to hammer out renewal language, which would apply for five years. Lincoln um, has, I believe it's fair to say that they have indicated to individuals that they may be interested in filing a new charter school application to seek the additional grades. I cannot say, I don't represent them. I don't, you know, I, I don't know if they definitive, definitively intend to do that, but that is an option that they have available to them. Okay, if so they do would... submit a new application, what does that do to the current application? Uh, it partly, 
It partly depends on what they say in the new application. Thank you. Director Breland? Yes, I was just wondering if there's any more questions. I also wanted to go to the topic that we talked about in terms of the expansion. And they talk about adding the number of students to a different, um, from other districts. So they want to keep our number at 780. Help, help me understand that number again. They want to keep our number at 785, but increase other enrollments for other students entering the district. The to the extent I, I know enough information, to, to the extent I think I understand what they're trying to do with the revisions that they provided to the renewal charter language that was sent to us last week, it appears that they want to increase the enrollment cap to 785 York City students and not have an enrollment cap above that, meaning they could enroll any number of additional students from outside the school district. That's that's how it reads to me currently. Attorney Peterson, may I interject here? I just just so we're clear here, Char or, uh, Lincoln Charter School is not a regional charter school. So does that, in essence, require Lincoln to, as long as there are York City school districts enrolling or attempting to enroll in Lincoln Charter, they would have to take the York City School District students before school students from outside the city. Under the charter school law, the resident students of the chartering school district where the charter school would be located are entitled to um, priority and enrollment, but that could possibly be subject to a cap or limitations in the charter itself. Please explain that further. Um, there, a, there, I, I guess the best way to answer the question is those would be competing sections of the charter school law. And it is unclear from a legal perspective um, which could be deemed to out prioritize the other. There are requirements, there are, there are provisions in the charter school law that permit um, resident students of the chartering school district to receive priority of enrollment over students who live in other districts. And how However, do we, how do we make that, how do we make that, how is that known that other students may have asked for enrollment, but then they didn't get that priority? Well, it would depend on whether a charter school was um, limiting enrollment. So by that, I mean, a charter school may have a cap in its charter, but it may not be at capacity for those seats. So if there is unlimited, if there are still seats available, then students would continue to be allowed to be enrolled and it would be first come first served and they wouldn't be at capacity to ever have that be an issue. However, if a charter school is, has enrollment capped, and the more students continue to enroll for which there are seats available, then there is supposed to be a lottery process and students uh, are entered into the lottery and the students from York City in theory would have priority in the lottery process and would be in kind of in a lottery amongst themselves to get into uh, for any uh, then available seats. So my, my question is, if they're saying that they wanna have 785 York City students, but they want a cap of 875, it's 90 students different. Once they get to 785, we no, long, no longer have the priority. I think they're talking about two different things there. Let me, again, let me try to clear clarify this. The original ask 
in the amendment, the written amendment request that was submitted in the fall asked for a cap of 875, period. It, that has evolved, I think, from conversations that the administration has had with Lincoln where they were actually saying, we don't want an increase in the cap where the cap is currently 785, but now it appears that Lincoln is asking for a cap of 785 York City only. And I guess unlimited above that. That's not clear because we haven't gone back and had that discussion because this just came in at the end of last week. But this that would be a, but that would be a change in their charter because currently the cap is 785 total. So we're clear. This is Director Orr. This I miss is Director Orr. Orr. How are you, Allison? It's good to see you again and hear from you. I hope you and your family are well. Thank you. They are. Yours as my well. Thing, uh, my thing with Lincoln, so they want to come to this board with no indication of no curriculum, but they come to us empty-handed and expect what about what of us? I mean, it, 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 this is really out of the norm. Uh, they should know better, I'm sure they do, to come to with a proposal to this district and don't have anything in place to upgrade their school enrollment. And then the other thing, too, is that they want to pull the majority of those students from this district. I mean, what seems to be the problem? Aren't they getting any uh, requests from other districts to send their children in here? I mean, it just seems so nonsensical, nonsensible to me for them to even come to us with this proposal, knowing full well that they don't have their curriculum in, in place to elevate sixth up to eighth grade. I mean, who is, who is actually running that school? They should know better. They should really know better. That, that's just a comment. It's really not a question, just a comment. Because I, you know, I, you, you know, I've been on, a, on the board long enough to know to deal with Lincoln. So, I mean, this is really. And, and going back to the lease part of it, too. Yes, we need to put some regulations in that lease. I'm not understanding why we took on the role of paying their bills in the first place. Let them take care of their own bills. Just let us concentrate on getting the rent. Let them pay their own bills. Let them pay their own utility bills. I will talk to Mr. We will take a look at that to see. Again, I apologize for not having that available to me right now. Um, but I wanna take a look at that language that was um, added or changed to the lease agreement. And if there, um, we'll, I'll talk to Mr. Snodgrass about that and, and we'll take a look at that okay. in light of the board's comments. So thank you for that. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any additional comments regarding this topic? And could we go back to the agenda, please? Okay, we'll have a health and safety presentation by Dr. Andrea Berry. Uh, just if I may interject, do you need, does anyone need me to stay on the line? I don't want to run your bill up. Yeah. I, it's Lulu, Allison. I, I think we're good. I was, with Thank that you, being Allison. said, good night. <laughs> We're good. Thank you very much, I Allison. Am. Thanks it's for nice coming, everyone. Hi, You're Allison. very welcome. But I will <laughs> take my leave. Coming. Good night. Right. Okay. All good right. night, Allison. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Are, good evening. Mm -hmm. We are ready to um, talk about health and safety in the school district of the city of York for the 2020-2021 school year. 
just a small bit of background um, about this whole process. Um, the school district of the city of York is taking its lead from the CDC guidelines as well as the PDE guidelines um, and guidance provided for re-entry and reopening of schools. And um, sometimes uh, the best way to describe what's going on is PDE is saying, here is what the research is kind of saying. And, um, and here are some options of what can be done. But the, the ultimate decisions for these options are up to individual districts. So PDE provides guidance and we make the decisions based on the guidance. Now in that guidance, they are now uploading specific, very stringent um, templates in which they, are have, they have some requirements of us as a district, one being a health and safety plan. It's a 40 page document um, that basically outlines health and safety for the district. Given that information, we are required and bound by that document to address what it's asking for. And each district in the state of Pennsylvania has to provide a document as such. And they are posted online on our district website as well as we have a place that we have to post them at PDE, kind of a general posting area for the state of Pennsylvania. So what I have before you is kind of an overview of the 40 page document. I'm, I'm certain that you wouldn't appreciate me going through 47 slides with you. Um, I know you love the sound of my voice, but probably not that much. So <laughs> I have provided an overview that captures the highlights of that information. Okay, Jess, Jessica, thank you very much. So this statement of commitment is, is nothing new and different. Basically talks about, we understand um, the importance, and I promise I won't read everything to you, but I do think it's important to read this of an in-person classroom setting for our Bearcats. We also understand that every family is in a unique situation, health and comfort level that we need to be ready to support. The health and safety plan that follows has been created to provide a safe environment for students and staff members with the return to school. More detailed information on student schedules and instructional delivery options will be provided at a later date. We thank you for your continued patience and grace as we work through this together with our students and staff's best interests in our hearts. So um, just letting you know that, you know, our ultimate goal is the safety of the students. Um, this is a multifaceted process. It's not something we can roll out all in one day. Essentially, we are trying to build three separate plans at one time and this being a fourth, so um, they all work in concert together or in conjunction because we can move in and out of different parts at different times, but this is just the beginning phase. So go ahead, Mrs. Altoff. These slides you've seen before, the foundation for our re-entry plan is based on our comprehensive plan, our educational expertise and our health expertise. Ms. Altoff. Again, you've seen before the re-entry plan essential expectations dealing with academics, physical and structural, business operations, and social and behavioral. So I wanted to give an opportunity to review some of the data that we have. Again, we've added some new data and we, are, you, we will see, I hope that you will see that we have been working diligently to get as much input as we can. Go ahead, Mrs. Altoff. So our parent survey res results are updated from the last time. Um, we now have our th same three areas um, and we are pretty much dead one third, one third, one third. So um, one th about a third of the population, 31.2% 30, 
wants to be physically at school, adhering to CDC guidelines, including social distancing, about 34.1% is interested in distance learning with teachers delivering standardized coursework virtually, and about a third of the what wants to see a combination of both. And basically, this particular data identifies the need for a virtual option. Next slide, Jess, please. Um, in the event that modifications are needed to reopen school um, to ensure social distancing, which option would you prefer between about 35%, point 0.8 and 0.5? They're, they're almost equal, 35.8% only wants to go to school virtually, and 35.5% is saying to attend school on alternate days, for example, um, physically on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and participating virtually on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So as you can see, we were asking them about disease prevention measures, um, and as you can see, the, the agreement um, for, for just about all of them is, is pretty apparent. Um, temperature checks, washing of your hands, wearing a mask, um, eating meals out, outside of the cafeteria, one-way traffic, <laughs> they're all pretty much, you know, trending that our families are agreeable to the disease prevention measures that we're we're anticipating putting in place. Go ahead, Ms. Altoff. We've added a, a um, teacher and staff um, survey to the mix. So we wanted to find out what their comfort level was about returning to the workplace on a normal schedule. 35.5 said that they're comfortable with some concerns. Um, a very small per, per percentage that's not measurable says that they're comfortable with no concerns. 35.2% said that they're not comfortable at all. And 23.1% says that they're somewhat comfortable. So the data is basically showing that half of the district employees were comfortable with a certain degree of returning to work. Go ahead, Ms. Altov. If school resumes in the fall, do you intend to return? 82% is saying yes, and 17% is uncertain. And there's a really small percentage that's saying no, almost, almost not visible to the eye as well as not measurable. So the majority of, of our employees do intend to come back to work. Okay, so our district phases of re-entry re are aligned with the governor's phases of reopening. It only makes sense. Go ahead, Jessica. So we operate in the state with a green, yellow, and red phase model. So we have created in our first peak a green, yellow, and red phase model for the school district of the city of York's um, proposed return. So the governor's phased approach in green, we are looking at the idea of an in-person learning option or a Bearcat cyber option for grades K to 12. So that would give the students of the school district of the city of York and their families a choice to either return via Bearcat cyber or return via traditional learning with social distancing. So I'm not finished, Just <laughs> We just started. <laughs> um, the school buildings open implement um, preventive practices and additional proactive protocols. Um, we are hoping to be able to provide any and everything that we need to, to make families feel comfortable about us as an option for educating their kids as we were before all of this happened. In the yellow phase, we would move a little differently and have a hybrid model um, ready and available for um, students with a, a, um, a day, B day, or some sort of 
variation where kids would not necessarily be in school every day, but or if they were, they would only be in half and the other half would be online. Or again, there is always the option <clears throat> of full-time Bearcat Cyber. So similar to the green phase, but noticing that there's an uptick. This would be in the event of an uptick in cases. If the state moved from green to yellow, we would then move from green to yellow as a response as well. And finally, in the red phase, we would all be remote. So it would be Bearcat Cyber for everybody. Okay, Ms. Altoff. In the area of facility, facility cleaning and sanitation and disinfectant and ventilation, we have taken some additional precautions or would like to discuss some additional precautions for the upcoming school year. Go ahead, Ms. Altoff. So in the parent survey results, um, these were some of the things that were requested. And these are some of the things that we are looking to provide. Maintenance and custodial staff will imp implement proper disinfectant procedures um, of offices and common areas. Those proper being utilizing cleaning supplies that are approved for disinfecting and um, eliminating co the COVID-19 virus. The staff and faculty and administration will be provided with those disinfectant classroom supplies and, off and offices for during the school day. Things like hand sanitizer, things like additional paper towels, readily available gloves, and um, wipes as well as spray bottles with disinfectant in them to be able to clean high touch areas throughout the day. Gone are gonna be the days where the only folks that um, clean are our maintenance staff. It is a all hands on deck and we are all in this together. So high surface areas. And I don't think this is anything new for most of our um, teaching staff and even our, our general staff. It is not uncommon to see someone wiping down tables after a lesson or wiping off high touch areas, not uncommon to see teachers wiping down computers. So we are thinking that um, given these additional materials, we will see some of that going on. Um, high traffic areas, including bathrooms, will be cleaned on a regular basis throughout the course of the day. We will have schedules in place where those areas will be hit, kind of like you see the um, the the posters in in public bathrooms and restaurants and such that show when the bathrooms were disinfected last, the time, the person, and the initials. You see that a lot. We would be doing something similar to that to make sure that we are are hitting those areas more often and documenting it. Um, We've ordered new equipment for more efficient and effective cleaning processes throughout the district buildings. For example, we've purchased um, the misters that if there is some type of exposure, suspected exposure, or any type of discomfort, we have the ability to call in the maintenance staff immediately to disinfect that room or that area or any of those areas that are in question immediately. Um, we have the portable and we also have the bigger, more industrial machines that we have at the school in the school district. I believe we have two of the big um, machines in now. And I believe we have four to five of the small um, backpack ones. And we are still in the process of getting more of the bigger ones in. So we are making sure that we have enough to um, spread across our district equally and, and, and be able to respond rapidly when we have issues. Um, the district also or, um, will be encouraging teachers to have windows open when possible for a more 
consistent airflow throughout the classrooms and the building to help fight any and, and all germs. Buses um, will be wiped down after each run with disposable wipes, towels, and sprays um, to under and, and undergo a weekly deep sanitation spraying, which would be the, the COVID killing agent. Next slide, Jess. The social distancing and safety protocols. Um, these are Pennsylvania Department of Education required categories. These are what they told us that we needed to have in this plan. Go ahead, Jess. So the classrooms will be organized to reorganize to provide distance between students to the maximum extent possible. Um, this includes maximizing the amount of furniture in the rooms, student desk in the rooms, and classroom space. We will assign student seats and all students will be facing one direction. You know, we usually have had clusters of students sitting together for cooperative learning. None of that is going to be because we want to adhere to social distancing. Um, students are strongly encouraged to bring water bottles to hydrate. Um, there will be no use of any water fountains in the school district of the city of York. If necessary, we will provide hydration opportunities where needed. If we need to have hydration um, water for students, we will provide it. All field trips will be discontinued temporarily. The last thing we want to do is have the students out of our control where they are at risk for higher expo exposure and we can't do anything to protect them from that. So we are temporarily suspending all field trips. Um, School-wide assemblies will temporarily be dis discontinued um, so we can make sure that we are adhering to social distancing guidelines. Um, grade level assemblies will be permitted in areas that allow for proper social distancing, such as gymnasiums, gymnasiums and auditoriums, as long as we are not reaching capacities and that we are able to properly social distance. Um, movement and mixing between groups will be minimized as much as possible. Some of the things that we are talking about is a move of perhaps teachers instead of moves of students. So instead of students moving from class to class, perhaps teachers moving from class to class to present hallway traffic um, to an extent. At the high school, that's going to be more of a challenge because there are specialized coursework, specifically in the maths. You can have a ninth grader in a, in a, in a low level or a high level math and you can have a 12th grader in a low level or a high level math. So it's kind of difficult to keep students together in one cohort all day when you have the delineation and differentiation of skill sets. So the health and hygiene protocols will be promoted and implemented from the beginning of the school year. We will be launching specific initiatives to promote hand washing, social distancing, proper usage of masks and all the things associated. This is new territory for all of us, specifically for our babies that we serve. They need to be taught how to properly social distance, how to not give hugs, because we've spent a whole lot of time putting in place the, this, this safe environment where we want them to, to feel comfortable and, and, and we want them to, you know, feel like we're a part of their extended family. We have to take a look at some of that and kind of rename some of that in the name of safety and not allow kids to hug, um, not allow kids to be playing contact games in, during the school day, trying to avoid handshaking when possible. So all of that is stuff that we have to teach, which is sort of the total opposite of what they've been learning in um, initiatives such as PBIS or some of their social groups that they are participating with our social workers, as well as what they used to do with our behavior specialists. All buildings with, um, will restrict non-essential visitors 
and volunteers from coming to the building. Meetings will take place virtually as much as they possibly can. So we will be pr pr promoting the use of virtual um, meetings as much as we possibly can to limit large crowds. We will be purchasing temperature check detectors that when students come into the building, their temperatures will be taken at the entrances. If there is a student that would have a temperature that is high, um, there is some in-service that needs to be done amongst adults to recognize and remember that every child that has a fever is not a positive COVID case. In case we forgot, there are a litany of students that come to school with fevers on a daily basis for, al for aller allergic reasons, allergies, for flus, strep throat, earaches, and the list goes on. So automatically causing a hysteria when a child has a fever is number one, unfair. Number two, unprofessional. And number three, not going to be tolerated. So we have to make sure that kids feel comfortable and understand that, you know, we are empathetic to the process, although we are nervous about what is going on. We have to be in control of the situation and, and have a process ready to go when these things happen. Next slide, Jess. So the larger areas where we gather, such as the cafeteria, instructional rooms, LGIs, auditoriums, will need to have staggered schedule for student use and follow those social distancing guidelines and be disinfected between uses when necessary. The cafeteria will follow social distancing guidelines as well. And when necessary, staggering seating will be used to avoid across the table seating. We will utilize the, caf um, the cafeteria, but um, we will not utilize it to the same capacity that we are currently utilizing it because currently we could have a large number of students in there at one time with several grades. We may have to cap that number, well, we will have to cap that number and make sure that kids are, are not on top of each other in, in places where they gather large groups. We will have hand white washing and disinfecting schedules after eating, upon entering the building, and before and after using the restrooms throughout the day. To assist with reminders for health protocols, signage will be posted in English and in Spanish in high traffic areas, such as outside entrances, restrooms, hallways. Um, CDC produced signage will be used whenever possible. It's important that we're using stuff that's approved by the CDC. So we're making sure that we have valid and accurate information. Recess and physical education classes, schedules and activities will be modified to follow social distancing. Students will use hand sanitizer or wash their hands upon returning in the building and going back to class. In the classroom, um, sharing items will be minimized as much as possible. Any and all materials will be used by, the, any and all materials that are generally used by multiple students will need to be sanitized by the teacher between uses. When feasible, students will be provided with their own materials, so sharing is minimal. Go ahead, Ms. Altall. Monitoring student and staff health. So we are going to um, be educating students, staff, and families on identifying the symptoms um, of COVID-19 to ensure that we're reporting in a timely manner. The district is going to require parents and guardians to evaluate their children, including temperature checks before school, but we're not going to just depend on that. We will be taking everybody's temperature every day when they come to school. We are asking everyone to be vigilant for symptoms, and we expect anyone who is showing symptoms of illness of any type 
to stay home. We will continue to make sure that we reinforce that that ask because it's important that if we think that there are there, there are any dangers, not just COVID nineteen dangers, but any kind of contagious dangers that students have, we don't want to be we don't want them to spread. We still have our regular communicable and non-communicable diseases to worry about, like flu, influenza, and all of those other different things that are um, or can be a danger, fifth disease. So um, once um, a student or staff member is sent home with the signs of illness or a history of exposure, a doctor's note will be required along with a protocol will need to be followed before that student can return to school. Should a confirmed COVID-19 case be encountered, the staff and family who have had the contact with the said person will be notified of exposure and then again we will have a protocol in place that we will follow on an individual case-by-case -case basis family and staff and the public will be notified of any closures within the school year changes and safety protocols throughout multiple media outlets. We will receive information through emails and families will receive communication through emails, home letters and district, district websites when necessary. Next slide, Jess. Jess, okay. Other considerations? So our nursing staff will collaborate with our higher risk students and staff for those who have complex needs to identify most effective op um, options for instruction. For example, we will be purchasing some disposable masks, masks for our students. We, um, we, I think we have about 5,000 in the district now and we have about six or 7,000 on order. But we will also be purchasing 100 face shields per school that will be housed in the nurse's office for alternatives to wearing a face mask. A face shield will be something that, for instance, a special education student who is receiving speech services who needs to see a teacher's mouth moving and needs to see the motion of the lips to form letters. So we will be using face shields in in lieu of face mask for those purposes. And if we have students with disabilities who cannot wear masks, or we have asthmatic students or other students who cannot wear a mask for whatever reason, we will make sure that we have face shields available. All staff members will be required to wear face coverings on school grounds at all times. And students will be required to wear face coverings on school grounds as well. The Pennsylvania Department of Education tells us that they will allow students to remove their face coverings when they're eating or drinking and following social distance guidance, seated at a desk or assigned workspace following social distance guidance, or engaged in activities following social distance guidance, face covering breaks, recess, physical, physical education, or activities. Um, any student that is not wearing a face mask due to a medical condition that is respiratory in nature, a part of their disability, et cetera, will require some communication with um, said physicians or healthcare providers before we can accept those situations. Ms. Altal, that concludes our overview. I will answer any questions or hear any concerns that you may have. Hey, Dr. Barry. Hello. Mr. Breeling. My first question is this, when we take a talk about social distancing mm -hmm. with our student population and our current setup, mm -hmm. are we looking at staggering days of students? Or are we looking at full implementation of student return? We are looking currently at full implementation of student return. And um, that is based on the IU-12. Every school district in the IU-12 is coming back full time 
with options. Some of them are doing um, some hybrid things, others, but for the most part, they are coming back full fledged with the option like we are to have cyber academy or um, other online type of situations. Well, I asked that question for this reason. Mm -hmm. We talked about implementing other programs and expanding. There was always a comment made that we didn't have enough room. So I'm trying to figure out under our current structure, how are we going to be able to socially distance when we already had limited space and now we're talking about spreading students out further in the district mm -hmm. and minimizing social distancing in the classroom and looking at our current class sizes. I'm trying to understand and wrap my mind about how is that going to be feasible for our district? Well, it's certainly not going to be easy. Let me first say that, but it's a great question. And given the data that we have right now, now we have about a 33 to 40 percent group of folks that are saying, yeah, I'm liking the cyber, um, the cyber situation. And so if 40 percent, if we are minus a, a minimal of 40 percent of our students, that is going to provide an enormous amount of space that we're not used to having. We also put together a plan to get a vast majority of our classrooms emptied at the end of the year. We weren't very popular, but we asked teachers to take any personal furniture or extra furniture out of the rooms to give us the opportunity to deep clean those rooms. And we are going to request that none of that personal stuff comes back so we can keep those rooms clutter free and be able to properly social distance for the school district of the city of york so then being be, that being said in terms of the 40 percent of the parents who are opting to do the cyber mm -hmm. then that would not be a full-fledged return back to class that would just be more or less a hybrid in some sense because we won't have all the students that we traditionally would have back in our buildings well but we are offering a full-fledged so offering a full-fledged but the option for those parents that went Cyber there, is there is an option for for Bearcat Cyber if parents are feeling uncomfortable. I think what what Thank the you. survey did say loud and clear is that we need options because everyone doesn't feel the same way. Thank you. You're welcome. This is Director um, Carmen. Um, what percentage of our parents filled out the surveys? We had at the last um, look, we had. 2,000, I think 300 surveys roughly. So out of 6,000, that's almost half. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Director Riviera. Um, reiterated on uh, Mr. Breland's uh, question, as far as, like you said, if they, excuse my outside. That's okay. Uh, as I said, as far as the, um, we're going to have some cyber virtual school, um, schooling when the kids come back, should we prepare for them to all come back? We should be preparing for them all to come back. We are. We are preparing for all students to come back. But the reality is that we know that a certain percentage is going to um, want to do cyber. Correct. Okay, question on, on the prep preparation for them all coming back. Um, and now and in the classrooms, are we doing six feet apart? Six yes. by six? Okay. Correct. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. thank you. So te technically what, what, what it all boils down to is to go back to old fashioned rows in the seating right. to get that six foot, um, to get that six foot distance. You know, we were very accustomed and very comfortable with cooperative learning and working in small groups. So temporarily gone are the days of having clusters of desks together because that doesn't promote the social distancing. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Dr. direct. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay, um, <clears throat> just one or two questions. Um, I forget what the percentage of, of, of the staff that, that in your graph that said that they uh, were somewhat 
uh, uncomfortable and and there was a smaller percentage that wasn't prepared to come back at all well, um, one second we- miss miss kennedy miss um Altoff, can you go back to that slide please okay go ahead mrs kennedy i just wanted to ask um do we have at least at this point any idea of what percentage of our staff uh, may be choosing not to return um, at all? And what is our plan for supplementing that? And how, or how, how is it going to impact services that we provide? And then if you can answer that, then I'll ask my second question. Okay. I wanted to pull up that. Um, that, that. It's fading me. Sorry, Dr. Ray. I'm sorry, not a problem. Um, in the meantime, Ms. Kennedy, basically, um, we have less than 2% that are saying that they are not going to return at all. Um, we don't have, I mean, again, we've just been a week into the teacher survey, so we don't have enough data to to determine what exactly, how many we have, okay. um, but you know there is some discussion. We had the um, stakeholder meeting today, and we did have some teachers on that stakeholder meeting. And, and one of the um, discussions was, what about um, specific staff members that have um, other health issues, and right. what is, what is going to be the process, consideration, or procedure for them? And we, we kind of, you know, said that certainly it would be a case by case basis and that there would be some required documentation, probably beyond a doctor's note without violating HIPAA. Because as we all know, um, doctor's notes are pretty easy to obtain. Just don't worry about it. If it's, if it's, it's all the problems, don't worry. It's up. Is it? Oh, I don't see it. It's up. It's just which. Yeah, it's up. Oh, it's it must be behind. Okay, there it is. I'm sorry. So, um, you know, we don't we don't have very many that um are saying oh, I'm not coming. I'm just not coming because I'm uncomfortable. I think many of them have some pre existing conditions that are making them nervous, and so that is um. And there may be options, like there may be an opportunity for some of those teachers to help with our cyber program if it gets to the point that we need extra um, hands on deck to help with cyber. So there are some other options. And then cyber, the cyber program was was um, actually my next question related to my next question. And um, how robust is the cyber program going to be um, this time around, uh, hopefully it is different from what we provided in the last several months of um, where we were all in a rush to provide something. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what the cyber program is going to look like um, for, for families or for students? The cyber program is going to be operated off of Odysseyware, which is one of the most robust curriculums out there for online learning. It is a... Um, a product that we are vendoring through the um, intermediate unit. And it is a product that has been offered at a deeply discounted rate for school districts based on um, the pandemic beginning back in February and March. So this product um, enables us to either hire teachers through Odysseyware at the very expensive price of about $400 per student or have our own teachers monitor and, um, and work with students in the asynchronous learning environment, meaning that they don't necessarily all have to be online at the same time. So we are looking at a variety of options to make that program more robust by utilizing our own staff and number one, saving money. And number two, being able to have teachers who have a preference to work in the online environment, perhaps be able to be more comfortable. And, and then one more related to our special education um, population or our special needs um, children, for those families who would opt not to, to, to return and do the online um, 
in what way are we preparing to provide the, those students with their, their um, identified needs through the we online have, Go ahead. We will have a, total, a, a, a comprehensive special ed staff on board that work for the district already to provide the accommodations and modifications needed in IEPs. Um, those IEPs that require some, some different modes we will be prepared to be able to um, provide some of those as well. If it means um, additional tutoring or some, some Zooming and face-to-face -face options to help those students, we, we are prepared to be able to meet those needs as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Director Kennedy. That one question was mine also, but I did have one more question. Yes, ma'am. As, as far as the uh, protocol, if let's say a teacher contracts the uh, COVID-19 virus, what is the, uh, I guess the quarantine period? And I guess, I guess I just wanna know what the protocol would be. I know a lot of this is in the talking phase right now. Correct. Have we considered that yet or? Yes, so if a teacher like really contracts, not exposed, but and not, you know, a lot of times they'll say I've, I've, I've been exposed to COVID-19, that's not contracting it. So um, if we know we have a positive test, you know, that information starts in HR and there is a process that they follow where we kind of track where that person has been or it ha has, was in the process of where were they in buildings. We can kind of look at camera footage as well as see what is going on in the district, um, making sure that we have um, an, a highlighted outline process saying, okay, this person is contracted. These are all the areas. Of course, those areas would be disinfected. Um, folks that were in con contact would be notified and um, there would be a possibility that some additional testing would need to happen. It's really difficult to give the protocol without the situation because the protocol can change if the person contracted it and was only in a concentrated area. I was just in the gym then it's just the gym and that area. And then we need to find out who was in the gym. So um, just trying to do some of that tracking of, of what has happened, who it has happened to, who was involved before you can say, okay, what you're going to do. But the bottom line is if there were folks that were involved, we're gonna suggest they be tested. We're gonna be quarantining people. Um, when we have situations like that now, we've had a couple, we've just cleared the department for the day so we could disinfect and then, um, you know, came back because once it's did, the area is disinfected, it's fine. Um, we haven't had necessarily had a positive case, but we've had some exposure areas. So um, given what happens with a specific person, if someone contracts, we'll go through those protocols that enable us to try to track and trace the best way that we can to get as many people, you know, tested in that cohort and communicate without violating HIPAA laws right. and guidelines because we can't necessarily say, oh, such and such has COVID-19, you need to get tested and because that violates HIPAA laws. So we will, you know, just suggest that they get tested um, and suggest quarantine when possible and necessary. Some of the things that are still really up in the air are if someone is quarantined for 14 days, do they use their time or do we provide time? Um, those are some things that are, are, still, are still things that have to be worked out and up in the air. The superintendents are having some of those conversations this week. And um, we, we just don't have all, all the answers yet. We, we just don't. So just to follow up to yeah, Diane. Diane just to follow hopefully up I answered your question, Ms. Diane. 
Yeah, yes, you did. And I know those conversations are being held in the business world mm -hmm. right now also. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was just wondering, I didn't hear it mentioned in the presentation. Mm -hmm. So one but minute, thanks. Mr. Breland, Director Breland, hold on for a minute, please. Go ahead, Ms. Sweeney. Um, yes, can you go back and give answer Director Kennedy's uh, question now that you have the survey up? I did answer Director Kennedy's question. Did you? Oh, do you want to bring up the chart. Yeah, we had it up. Did I, the, Director Kennedy, did I answer your question? Yes, because it, it came up on my screen before okay. it came up to you. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see it, but I was talking while it, before it came up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, President Sweeney. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mr. Breland, Director Breland. I was going to do a follow-up to Diane's question in terms of a person who may have to use their time. Are you having the conversation about short-term disability, if that's Available. Um, the, the, super, or, the superintendents are talking about that, Mr. Breland. But um, if it's a 14 day period, you know, we don't know that what that is going to necessarily be necessary to use for short term disability. But um, I, that has come up. So um, I think we're just kind of putting all our cards on the table. Um, the, the nice thing about it is we're trying to be consistent with all the districts in the county. So um, as well as the IU, so we don't we don't fall up against um, well such and such is doing this and such and such is doing that. So the methods at which we do things may differ, but we're all saying, look, we're doing face to face with the option for cyber, and then we're we're all saying, if someone's exposed for fourteen days, this is what needs to happen. So we're making sure that we're consistent across the board, which is part of the reason why we don't have some of these answers yet, because you know, when you get a whole bunch of um, people in the room with strong personalities, you know, you know, you guys don't know anything about that, though. Sometimes it gets a little heated. <laughs> well, the, reason, the, reason why hey. that, the reason why I asked that question is because it's going to be an insurance requirement, depending on who their insurance carrier is, despite what the conversation is, but their insurance carrier is going to really dictate how people are going to use their time. That's Correct. Right. And, 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 then, and then there's other options like supplemental insurance. So it's a little bit more complex than just disability, 14 days, use your sick time, not use your sick time. You know, people have AFLAC and different things where they have supplemental insurance and some of that may come into play as well. So, yeah. um, you know, we'll just have to kind of see which way it kind of goes with the, with the superintendents as well as kind of share um, in, in our stakeholder group, as well as our cabinet group, what we think might be a best practice um, and that that will will be in the best interest of the district. So in, in these times that we're living in with COVID, hopefully when people are up coming up for their renewal, for their insurance for the next year, open enrollment, they might start having those conversations in terms of supplemental insurance that would help them when they get into a jam if they don't have enough sick time accrued right. and what could assist them with getting through that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Open enrollment is over. So, um, but well, yes, open enrollment right. starts back up in no, 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 no. open enrollment for the school district is over. Oh, that's over for the district. Oh, ours don't come up we, until November. Yeah, November. We, we do it. Um, we do it in the summer. So, it, you know, it, you get, we kind of do it at the end of June and, and then, and it's due back like early July because, if you have some of those supplemental deductions, they start back July 1st, so. Thank yeah, you. fiscal year is different, mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Question. Yes, ma'am. Um, all students are required to have a, a doctor on their um, personal data sheet, yes or no? I, I, I'm not under, I, I can on, on that. Sapphire? I can answer that question, um, Dr. Berry. Okay. No, they, they don't have to have a, a doctor listed. And that's only because we now live in a world where sometimes families go to groups of doctors, like health groups. So you see a different doctor every time. So they're not required to have one listed in their records for us in Sapphire. It's not a requirement. But they'll have their health group listed if that's where they're... Well, that's, what, that's, I, what, that's what, what I'm saying. They have to have somebody medical medically listed on their paperwork. Because I'm just thinking about parents who don't have health insurance. And, yeah, you know. typically, 
typically they do, they, they write down whatever group that they take their kids to for physical and things like that. They write it down, it's there, but it's not required. It's what they choose to share with us. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Any other board members? Not about presentation. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Thank you. I will say one thing. Uh, am I still on? Yes. Yes, go ahead. I would, I would have liked to have seen more than, I know the district has really tried, but I would have liked to have seen more than um, almost 50% of our parents take the survey. Actually, you know. it actually it's over fifty percent. So we have. I, I I was look. I was looking at that data while while we were talking. So we technically have forty six hundred households in the district, and we have like twenty three hundred. That's fifty percent. So yeah. that's that's half. Yeah. And I mean, my and my goal was half. My goal was to get at least half because you know. But I am with you, Ms. Bryant. We, we right. really should be able to get more. But I mean, we've we've pounded that sand every week. I know, and, 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 we're, still, and we're still pounding it. So um. that that's good, and we know it's going to be an after fact. Um, I hate to say it, then we'll hear all this other stuff later Absolutely. when they have an opportunity to um, partake in the survey. But I know that board members have been a very instrumental in helping us get some of them filled out too. And, and we appreciate that because, you know, we want as many people as possible so we can avoid, I didn't know, nobody asked me. Right. You know, so we want to make sure that we, we're circumventing as much as that as we can. Plus people have alternative opinions that they bring to the table that you don't necessarily think about. So it's important to be able to hear their voice and Correct. that is your voice. So there are a variety of people um, in the district that are employees that are sharing out that survey on a weekly basis, as well as I have seen several of you all on social media mm -hmm. outlets sharing it out. So mm -hmm. I think, and um, and then of course, don't forget our parent liaisons, they are, um, they're kind of beating the doors. I've had some schools do some cold calling where they picked up the phone and say, hey, do you have time to fill out this survey with me? I'll enter the data for you if you just answer the questions. That's so awesome. Those, those school, you know, schools are taking that, and, you know, kudos to everyone in the district who is trying to get input so we can do what's best for the kids. Um, we, right. we appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Barry. Mm -hmm. And if we could have our technology person scroll down so that the board members could see the other items for discussion. I'm, I'm sorry, my internet went out for a minute. I did have another question before we uh, go to the next. Um, go ahead, Director Brown. And I, okay, and, and I had to step away, uh, so I may have missed it. I know we talked about how many uh, parents were surveyed um, in correlation to how many uh, parents are in the district, but how many how many teachers were surveyed based on this, our staff volume? We, I think we, we, we just put that survey out last week. So we've only had it up for like four days. But we had over, let me get the number. I, I, I wanna say we had about 200 surveys, um, 732, there we go. 732 surveys. From, and it's, it's, not, just, it's not just teachers, it's all staff. Okay. All staff, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Director Brown. Dr. Barry. 
Yes, ma'am. Can you, I think, I don't remember if we talked about F before. Can you explain that? F, to me? Like, F like Frank or S? F as in Frank. The illumination, the illuminate contract. So the illuminate contract was on last month and, I, right. pull, and I pulled it um, because um, Solicitor Ghetto and I wanted to tighten up some language in it. There was some language that wasn't meshing with our um, philosophy as a district as far as um, renewal and some of that other stuff. So we wanted some time to get that language cleaned up. And um, Attorney Ghetto worked with um, with us to work with Illuminate and um, they did com comply and agree mutually to some of the things that we were asking for. So there was nothing that was in the contract as of now. And this, if you remember, Mrs. Br Director Bryant, this is the contract that has the um, the assessment programming that's going to help us have a, a, a more aligned and better streamlined assessment process. So we just, we pulled it only because there was some language that we had to get straight on. And that's not uncommon that we have to pull that kind of stuff for stuff like that. Attorney Gettle had, had discussed some of it and when it when I saw it on the agenda I said oh we need to pull that so that was that was totally me just not okay. remembering and that and I had it pulled I thought we yeah I thought we had talked about it, it before. was on last month okay so you guys are not crazy I am <laughs> okay Dr. Baird you want to speak yes. about J 2020-2021 draft for the school calendar yes I do um the current school calendar um, would have had us starting school. The one that you approved earlier on would have had teachers coming back to school. Let me pull my calendar up so I can make sure I'm giving you accurate information. We would have had teachers coming back to school um, the 17th, I believe, and kids coming back the 24th we um, are looking, or, or it might've been the 10th and the 17th, I think. So we are looking to push that out a little bit. We would like to revise the calendar for um, teachers to come back on the 25th, which is a Tuesday, and students to come back on the 31st. That is consistent with what is going on across the IU. Um, because it's giving us some extra time in case additional guidance comes out from PBE in case numbers spike before the start date and we decide to go remote totally. So it's just given us a, a, a couple weeks wiggle room to be able to, to get a little bit longer to make the decision, but we need to make, make this decision at this, at this month at the board meeting because we don't wanna wait until August and not give parents enough notification. So, um, you know, it, uh, it does, put us in school an extra week and a half, but we will still be getting out around the time that we would normally get out in June, um, around the 10th or the 12th or something like something like that. We won't be going until the 20th or, or anything like that. So we were getting out fairly early in like the first week of June, and this is gonna push it a week or two, so. Um. Uh, this is Director Riviera. Yes, ma'am. Now, is that going to be enough time to actually get our schools situated, cleaned, and, you know, properly done for the kids to come back in September or in August? Or do you want to put it in September to start in September after Labor Day? Well, I, um, we did contemplate an after Labor Day start, but I believe um, after talking with the teachers, I, I think that they would prefer to not go, um, not go much further into June than we already are. Um, I can certainly poll them again between now and the board meeting to kind of get a, a sense. The 31st gives us additional two weeks for kids. I, I think it's, at, I mean, at that point, I kind of I, I kind of think we're in a situation where we're backed against the wall and we kind of have to make a decision. Um, another week 
mm, is not going to make a big difference in my humble opinion. Um, if, if it's something that you think we should definitely explore, like I said, I'll go back and poll the teachers, but I'm pretty certain that most of them don't want to be in, in school past the 15th. My thing is right now, you have your president here running around here trying to make everybody go back to school. You're going to cut your funding and everything else, which you can't do. But um, I don't want to be pushed too fast, too soon, and then we end up back at square one again. You know what I'm trying to say? I want to make sure that everything is done smoothly, safely, and give, give us enough time so we can so we can make sure everything is done smoothly and safely for everybody to return. That's my that was my main concern. That's all my main concern is. I just want the concern that that everybody's certainly, going to be safe returning. Certainly, um, other board members, do you have any discussion about that? Well, I, my question is that we spoke to the buildings and grounds department and see how far along the custodians are and mm -hmm. cleaning the buildings. Can you say can we or have we? Have we? Have we? They're 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 on they're they're doing pretty well. I I was I, I've had a conversation with with many of them, and and they're coming along. The first that they're hearing of a push of the school year is tonight, so they're prepared to be ready, and that was on purpose. They're prepared to be ready, you know, on the seventeenth as of tonight. So um, this conversation is only heard by those who are on listening. So until the vote, official vote, as far as they know, the 17th is their go date. Um, the buildings are looking pretty good. I've been in, um, I've been in about six of them. Um, and, and would they like more time? Absolutely. Um, but I certainly think that um, because they've been in the buildings, especially the schools that have been doing school lunch, they're in a lot better shape than some of the schools that haven't but um overall our our our, cust our our custodial staff has been busting it out and and it and it is getting done and they're doing um a yeoman's job of trying to get these buildings ready for kids so kudos to them hi director riviera answered uh, she asked my question because i had the same question that director riviera had but she asked it mm -hmm. i'm sorry uh, I said, I said, oh, okay. She, Riviera, she asked the same question I had. And, and, and again, if you all want me to poll the teachers, I, I you know, I, we're, we're still in negotiations. So, um, you know, and, and I, and I want to try to honor some of, of, of what they really want. And I know being in school late in June is something that they don't necessarily appreciate. Um, and so given that we're still trying to negotiate a contract, um, I, I don't know if that's a, 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 a tree we want to bark up, but um, I can certainly take it to them and, and ask for their input. If you all tell me that you think that that's what I should do. I, I'm not opposed. Well, I also believe too that as we con continue to monitor what's happening with this pandemic, that would give us more information as well to make an informed decision as to how we would like to proceed. Okay. I agree, no, Dr. Bear. I agree with that too. Um, but I had um, Director Riviere's question made me think of um, two other things that I that I missed. So forgive me um, for slightly going back. But as far as the buildings being prepared, um, and we may have mentioned this before, so just remind me: Have we, because some of our buildings are pretty old, have we addressed and looked at the ventilation systems and the um, the water systems to ensure that um, we have what we need to either upgrade or improve um, yes. to be sufficient for this. Yes, and in fact, in in the um in the document, we talk about um increasing the number of times that we're changing filtration by fifty yes. percent. Okay, so and we're the other the, we're changing the filters fifty percent more than we have previously. Okay. And then the um, last question I had around that was, um, as far as the social distancing um, for students, um, have we looked into um, obtaining and purchasing the, the plexiglass, plastic, whatever, um, 
um, stands for each one of the desks to put around to, to put around those students to at least add an additional layer of um, safety? We have looked into the plexiglass, um, but it's not a feasible option because there's some safety concerns with um, and and some issues with special ed kids and and the um, enclosed space offered by. So we have a variety of concerns about the plexiglass. We are putting the plexiglass up in nurses stations and in areas that kids are going in with interaction, but um, there's some there's some concerns about the plexiglass around individual desk um, being not necessarily the best option. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It might not, the plexiglass um, might, this is Director um, Carmen, the plexiglass might not be the best option for certain students, but how about the option for the majority of the students? I mean, maybe we can come up with something else for the students where the plexiglass is not a good choice. Um, Director Brian. Brian. President Sweeney, I believe if we would do it for some of the students, we would have to do it for all the students, especially if, if it has anything to do with special ed. We have to treat them the same as we treat the rest of our students in our building. Am I correct? That that is that is correct. Um, it there, there's some discussion and some research about plexiglass and seclusion, um, and so we don't want to, to offer an environment that's not inclusive, but secluded. We want to, we want to offer a, an environment of safety, but seclusion is not what we're after. And so, um, you know, there's really mixed research out there about it. Um, and, and, there's some, and there's some danger associated with some of it as well. Um, the materials, um, the high level of, of, of plastic, the, the, the expense. Um, I'm just not sure that it's the best option right now. I, I, I honestly don't know. I'm certainly not the, the expert on plexiglass and its material, what it's made of. Um, but, I, but I certainly can make sure that I have... Um, maintenance on this call next week so we can have some some more discussion about that. Dave, do you know anything about that plexiglass specifically? Dave? Dr. Barry? Yes. Yeah, this is uh, Chuck. Oh, there is Chuck. There's maintenance. There's Chuck. <laughs> Hi, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> um, it all depends on this. the the plexiglass is uh, very good, but we've been using uh, the Lexan because it's not a breakable and it's just sturdier and it holds uh, up a lot better. So uh, the kids getting hurt uh, by touching the edges and stuff is, is uh, a little bit better. I don't think the material itself is harmful at all that uh, because I think everybody and his brother is selling it now. Uh, it's basically the, a little bit heavier grade to what the face shields are that we are going to be buying for the, uh, the students uh, for their safety. So as far as the materials, I don't think the materials are a problem. The cost is astronomical though. That's, that is going to be a big, big concern. Uh, I don't know that we could uh, handle the cost of, of what it would cost to, for every student or desk in, in the district. And that's all I got. Okay. <laughs> we appreciate you being <laughs> on. <laughs> now, Chuck, how are the guys doing with cleaning the building while you're there? Uh, they seem to be doing pretty good. We have a couple of... Uh, 
uh, schools that are a little bit behind, but uh, we're going to be moving some people around to try and catch up on them. But uh, for the most part, we're, we're doing very well. I'm pretty happy with what we got out there. So, so Chuck, would, would you say that the um, moved opening date would be a welcome surprise? Yeah, I prefer not to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I agree, but I'm, asking, I agree. I'm asking you if it's a welcome surprise. <laughs> yes, it, it, it would be a very welcome surprise. Okay. <laughs> and they are listening. <laughs> they are listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's somebody listening. So if, yeah. if they're listening, you know, that means that we don't want you to like, you know, we want you to to supersize the work, not not undersize. <laughs> <laughs> Keep doing the great job that you're doing. Okay. Yeah. That's, I up. agree with you. We appreciate you guys. Thank you uh, so much for all your hard work. Uh, yes. Uh, we appreciate y'all. Uh I do well, I'll talk to Dr. Barry about the uh, some of the materials that are teachers left behind. So we'll we'll discuss that later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do any other board member have any other items that they want to discuss? If not, we'll move on to other remarks. Hearing none, superintendent's remarks. I just want to um, let you know that we are certainly um, diligently and expeditiously working to try to iron out as much of this as we possibly can, as quickly as we can. Um, many of the leadership team members are, are working, you know, in multiple capacities to make sure that they are helping with this eat re-entry stuff. We have committees that are working at different paces, um, instruction, leadership, um, school safety. We, we have uh, um, communication. So there, there are a litany of people who are heading up a litany of committees to try to make sure that no stone is left unturned. I want to publicly thank my staff for all the extra above and beyond work that you have done this summer. I certainly appreciate, um, you know, the effort that and, and the foot that you are putting forth to show our kids the best and safest opening that we possibly can. I can't thank them enough for um, the extra hours as, as well as, you know, the, the listening ears and, um, all of the expertise, um, be it, be it um, past practice expertise or um, um, future ready. So I appreciate you all and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Thank, thank you. you. Madam President, that concludes that program. Thank you, Mr. Director Can Bray. I ask one more? This is Director Kennedy. Can I ask one more question based on Dr. Barry's um, final remark? Please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Dr. Barry, would it be possible once we finalize all the plans and everything and, and confirm this August 31st date and whatnot, could we plan on having a, a community um, meeting via Zoom or something for uh, families and students so that we can um, prepare them for what what processes are going to change and what things are going to look like if they opt for in school and also for online so that they have an opportunity to at least um, at least hear everything one time in full before school actually begins. If the board is amicable to that, I am certainly um, willing to set that up in um, multiple situations. I'll get Shaquana on that, um, trying to look at um, any type of um, social distancing events or Zoom meetings or both. So yes, if, if the board is amicable to that, I am certainly open to it. Sounds my, good. My, my fellow board members, your thoughts? I think it's a great plan. Sounds good. Sounds Communication good. Communication is always great. Yes. Right. I agree. It also sounds like it'll help the transition a lot easier also. Okay. 
Thank shall, you very much. Shall it be written? Shall it be done? <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, Madam President, that concludes that program. All right. Thank you, Chairman, uh, Director Braylon, Director Bryant, the Athletic Committee. I think we did have something up for discussion. It's no longer there. Um, I, we were supposed to talk about fall sports and the um, the, the PIAA new rules that came out for COVID, what we were supposed to be seeing across the board with our fall sports. Okay, um, Director Bryant, this is Ms. Thomas. Mm -hmm. unfortunately, unfortunately, that's not gonna happen today because I have not had the chance to meet with the people from the high school. So when I return, that's a priority and then we'll be able to discuss it. But they are, anybody who's conducting voluntary workouts at this time are following the guidelines that was issued by PIAA. So our kids are safe. Okay. Um, go, go, go ahead, Director Bryant. Sweeney, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, um, Superintendent uh, Lulu, um, on Wednesday, the 15th, PIAA is going to put out another message. We don't know what it's going to be as far as fall sports are. I don't know if you were um, aware told that. about that, aware of it. Yeah, I'm aware they're going to be coming out with something. We'll be ready. We'll get it. No, well, okay. So we'll get well, it, review it. We'll get it. We'll review it and make any adjustments that we need to make to make sure everybody is aware of what's going on. And we'll make sure you all are aware. Okay. So, but, go ahead, Director Brian. Miss um, Miss Tom, is it is it possible? Can you can you forward to me what is in existence right now? Um, I can, but you can always go onto the PIWI website and get it yourself. But if you can't access it, I will forward it to you. I believe we sent it once before. I'm if I'm not mistaken. Everybody else get it? I'm Ooh. not sure. I know I sent it to somebody, but I can send it again. Thank you so I'll very much. I'll send it much. to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other remarks? Well, even though we're not, we don't know what we're doing with our fall sports. When we were speaking of sports, um, we were talking um, in the beginning of the year about the grade and the policy from PIAA to York City School District grades. Where do I, we, think, I that thought that was going to be brought up during the policy session, but if, if they want to talk about it now, we can talk about it now. It's, it's actually, it's that policy is not up on this month's agenda. It will be ready for the August meeting. It's not on this month. It'll be ready for August. So on August's committee meeting, you'll have the um, policy draft for those changes in terms of guidelines for PIAA eligibility for the district to play sports. It, I, um, not for the district, was not PIAA. I thought we were going to make adjustments to the PIAA. You, you, we are, but you, when, when I give you the draft, you'll see what's existing and then what adjustments you would like to have made. Okay. That's what the draft will contain. It'll contain the original, and the changes. And you'll see that in August. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other remarks? None being superintendent remarks, athletic committee. I have none. That's the report, President Sweeney. Thank you, Director Bryant. Buildings and Grounds, Director Liggins. Okay, good evening, um, Madam President. Uh, looks like um, all members are present except for Director Tanya Thompson-Morgan. Um, items for discussion. The schools, of course, have been closed and all facility use permits are on hold until such time as our facilities are deemed safe for use. I'll talk, could you just click on um, item B, the PDF?
Okay. Um, for buildings and grounds, um, June 2020 disbursements, as you can see, is now on Excel spreadsheet. I am unable to, to see the bottom. Can we scroll down? Okay. Does any board members, directors have any questions? in reference to the June 2020 disbursements. No questions? I have a question. You said um, Trichel Consulting Service. And somebody to share with me what that entails. Mr. Daffendale, is he still on? There. They are the uh, E-rate uh, consultants that are used to get the district uh, preferential pricing on different products and services that are purchased. A lot of it is related to uh, information technology uh, and getting the best prices on the various purchases that uh, the IT department uh, executes. That dollar amount represents two years of, uh, of uh, payments to the vendor. Uh, my understanding that, uh, that this vendor, this E-rate vendor has been used for uh, multiple years uh, going backwards. So they do all the work on the behalf of the district as the consultant for uh, why do we have a, a two-year report up there and not just like a, a current you know something current because it kind of you know director brian from what if from what i understand is uh she would have been paid back during the time that the pandemic started and because all that went on and she didn't get paid then, so there I put that on this tally. Is that correct, Mr. Um, Diffendall? Yes. Thank you. Good question. I asked it too. Mr. Diffendall, your 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 speech is really really bumble like you're underwater. I've tried to do all the adjustments I can. Now that's better right there. That's good, right where you're at now. Does any other board directors have questions in reference to the 20, June 2020 disbursements? Okay. Ms. Altoff, if we can close that and click on the next PDF. Uh. Director Liggins, the attachments that are on there for B and C look like they're the same. Okay. I do apologize. I'm not sure, but they do look identical. Um, we may have to check on numbers, the letter C and see if there's a different attachment that didn't get well, I can't see because my screen is black. I didn't share it at the moment. Oh, okay. Hold on. I'm just letting you know that letter C uh, is the same as letter B. So did you okay. want me to make future projects? No, I need to review that again because um, when I looked at it, I didn't catch that. And thank you for that. Sorry. Give me a second and I'll share the screen back out. There you go. You okay. should have the agenda now. Okay. Um, with letter D... Uh, we do have some ongoing projects um, within the district and they're listed under letter D. And uh, we have discussed these items at the last board me uh, committee meeting. And then we also have some future projects um, coming up that are pending. Director Liggins, this is Chuck. Yes, ma'am. Just yes. want to let you know the roof is done at Smith. 
And also the masonry work is being wrapped up this week. We will be starting Ferguson project next week. Okay. Um, could, could we um, have that on the report next time when projects are completed? That would be a huge help. Just to keep the board directors updated on what's being done and completed. Okay. I will um, look over letters B and C. If you give me a second, I can pull these up on my phone. Is that, um, are you okay with that, President Sweeney? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, I have a question, uh, Chuck, sorry, Mr. Wartz, excuse me. You said that Fer you're going to start on Ferguson. I'm looking at the um, future projects, and I don't see Ferguson on the list. Uh, Ferguson was approved uh, probably back in January or February uh, to be done. That's uh, roughly around $70,000. That's to repair roof, those uh, roofs that have been leaking since the day the building was built. Uh, we had somebody come in and we, they put the wrong flashing in. So, uh, therefore we have, I think it's six or seven rooms that water just pours in when it rains into the electrical panels and lights. Uh, we did some investigation back in, in the, uh, early spring and we found out what it was and it's something, uh, that has been approved and, and it's, but it's, uh, they're just getting around to it. So. I, I thought we discussed that that was back in the fall. Oh well, yeah. That, that, that goes back quite a few years to be honest with you. We just found the prod found out what was wrong with it. Um, in the, in the last year and a half. Uh, and then we put it off and we put it off and then, uh, finally, we decided to, that we needed to get it done. So, but it should have been part of the warranty program back when the school was built. And they, my predecessors didn't follow up on it. And it, uh, I finally got called up on it. So um, that's why it's getting done now. Okay. I mean, somewhere I, I'm remembering Mr. Miller explaining yeah. it to me. Right. He, 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 yeah, he would have probably explained the engineering part of it to you. I'm right. Sure. I thought that project was done. Okay, mm -hmm. are working on it. Okay, okay, so we need to have that on the report as well, okay. if you don't mind. No, no problem. Mm -hmm. And President Sweeney, I cannot pull those reports up nowhere else. So um, prior to the meeting, I could not access the reports. Um, but after we had our executive session, because they weren't available before the meeting, so, um, well, uh, 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 Director Liggins, to rest yes, sure, I do have a copy of them, and they are, they are the same. Okay. I have the okay. paper copy. Well, can we um, just open up letter, I guess we can just uh, look under letter C, um, B, it doesn't matter which one. Can we, just, I just like to see it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Does any other board directors have questions? Not under this respect, not under this respective item, but I do have a question. Yes. Yes. Mr. Is this Mr. Breland? Yes. Yes. My question has to do with um, the number of recent fireworks going on around the city and just riding past some of our schools, seeing the number of debris that was laying in our playgrounds areas. Um, is there any way that we could have captured any of that on video to see how we can rectify that problem and stop that from happening on our properties? I think we, we may have to talk to security. Um, Dr. Barry, do you have any insight on that? Is that something security would have to go back and look on the cameras and 
we can probably ask security um, if you, Mr. Breland, um, if you have specific schools that you, you want to um, talk to me about, I will have them look at that camera footage and see if we can see anything. Um, we did have a couple of incidents. Um, we had some severe damage done to the roof at McKinley earlier in the summer and had to replace um, sections of the roof as a result of firecrackers being thrown on top of the building mm -hmm. and, and, and singeing the roof. So um, it is, it is indeed a problem. And um, Mr. Breland, if you can get me those specific schools where you saw the debris, I can ask um, security to look at those cameras. I know that Ferguson was one of them that we saw a lot of debris. Okay. And I believe I saw some at Jackson. I didn't go over to Hannah Penn. Ferguson, Jackson. And I would check up at Smith too because we have a large field up there. Yes. Ferguson, Jackson, and Smith. Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, President Sweeney, I'm not sure who we need to address um, on that ordeal of fireworks, but I believe they just changed that, that rule in the city to be able to let them off in the city. I think we need to go back to city council, I think. I'm not sure who it is, but they need to readjust that rule because they're not, they're supposed to be a thousand feet away from a building and people's, they're a thousand feet away from their buildings, but they're not, this is just FYI, but they're not a thousand feet away from another building. But that's some um, ordinance that they just changed, if I'm correct. Damn much for buildings and grounds. This is Director Orr. Shit. This is Director Orr. Yes. If uh, our cameras are picking up the responsible people who are doing this damage to our buildings, I think their parents need to be held accountable for the damage. I, I agree with you, Director Orr. Because, I mean, come on now. We got to make them start having some responsibility here. And uh, some are doing it with their parents. I was going to say, it's not only the children. It's some of them I know, are I just, I just said whoever is doing it. I didn't necessarily say children. I said who is doing the damage, they need to be held accountable. If our cameras are picking up these people doing the damage to our buildings, they need to be held accountable. Whether it's children or adults, they all need to be held accountable. Director Liggins, is there anything else? Uh, yes, thank you, um, President Sweeney. I just, she just um, pulled up the summarized expenditures for, um, from July 1st of 2019 to June 30th of 2020. That's the report that um, wasn't listed. So I just wanted you guys to kind of eyeball that in case you had any further questions. And does any board directors have questions or, or concerns? Mr. Director Bryant, did we ever settle that out with the rental of the vehicles? I think that's something that's been brought up several times already. I'm not sure exactly what we decided the last um, board meeting. I know there was some discussion about it would it would be cheaper to rent, but then there also was another conversation um, looking into buying i i mean if uh i took notes on that so uh if mr diffendall would have any uh of that conversation that he may have spoken to mr snigress about in reference to those rental vehicles to update us that would be great but i know um there's have been there have been conversations that it was um cheaper to rent the vehicles um just because of the cost and maintenance and so forth. So currently the district leases uh, the majority of the vehicles in the fleet um, and the costs are, you know, instead of 
plunking down hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars at, at a time to buy vehicles, the option has been to, to lease any asset that is depreciating. So I'll give you a, a, an example. Photocopiers are another item that depreciate tremendously over time and they're actually obsolete uh, you know, five years after they're manufactured. So the general consensus in the finance world is that you lease depreciating assets as opposed to purchasing them. Uh, two reasons, one is you lower your cost each month. And second is you don't have to come up with the upfront money to buy a fleet of 15 or 20 vehicles. Uh, you know, a, a, a pickup truck, uh, even a bare bones kind of base models in the $30,000 range. So if we would be out in the market buying 15 vehicles at $30,000, that would be $450,000. District would need to outlay at one time. So the, the uh, approach has been, not to say we shouldn't revisit it, but the, uh, the current approach is to lease vehicles, uh, just like many people lease vehicles in their personal lives. It's, it's not dissimilar. You lower the amount of money you need up front to get into a vehicle. Uh, also, please note that if a vehicle is to be replaced, Enterprise will give the district a credit based on the condition of the vehicle. So, for example, if you trade if you trade in or change a pickup truck, they will give a, a residual value to that leased vehicle. If that that credit is then applied toward the payment of the replacement or new vehicle, so it's. Uh, my experience in over 30 years of finances and fleet management, uh, the vast majority of vehicles are used, uh, primarily to save that capital outlay up front. Uh, Thank you very much. I will not bring that up again. <laughs> Don't say nothing, Michael. Don't say nothing. <laughs> Okay. Did, did any other board um, directors have questions in reference to the expenditures? Any remarks from the superintendent? No remarks. Madam President, that concludes my buildings and grounds report. Okay, thank you, Director Liggins. Mark, I welcome. have a remark. I have a remark. Oh, yes, Miss. Because I, I don't see any um, place that we talked about it today. I know, I think it was last board meeting that the, um, we had somewhere in the buildings and grounds where we had to have somebody from an outside source to do the windows or doors or something like that. And somebody was supposed to be checking into whether or not um, our people themselves could work on the windows because there was not a specific time for those windows to be um, completed. Do we have anything on that again tonight? I know we discussed it. Yeah, I, believe, Brian, I believe you're referring to the uh, request to do door and window replacement at several of the buildings. Right. Staff and maintenance staff have been geared entirely to uh, disinfecting the buildings, mm -hmm. buildings ready for uh, for the mid-August uh, return to school. So, uh, what we will, my suggestion is, I will get with uh, Chuck Works, and we will look at and bid the project uh, using our labor, internal labor, and also bid it using third party or the window and door providers installation. Um, Thank you, because that's what we had talked about having done, you know, instead of outsourcing and spending all that money, because they said there was not a particular time that the windows had to be completed. Uh, their focus has been entirely in getting the buildings ready for, for mid-August return maybe now the end of August uh, return, but still, as, as Dr. Barry said, uh, no one has told anyone that uh, we were looking to push the date to, they have been completely on the timeline to 
get the buildings ready for the teachers return. Thank you. I look forward to that um, that bidding process. Thank you. Thank you, Director Bryant. Director Liggins, is there any? No, I, I already asked the superintendent if she had any remarks and she said no. And then that concludes my report, Madam President. Well, thank you, <laughs> Director, <laughs> Director Liggins. <laughs> Director Orr, you have the cafeteria committee report? Yes, uh, all my members, well, not all are, are present. Uh, Ms. Tanya Thompson Morgan is absent. I didn't get any notice as to why she wasn't coming, so I don't know. Um, so we're going to go with items for discussion. Mr. Mark Kamasik, if you're on board with us. Absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, just going to go through the committee notes um, for uh, the month of June. Um, just as an update for meals, uh, as of July 6th last week, uh, we served just shy of 24,000 breakfast meals and 24,000 lunch meals uh, since we closed back in March. Um, for the month of June alone, we served an average of 271 lunch and breakfast meals per day uh, among our four sites, which is pretty good considering last year we only served 167 meals per day in June with five sites. So uh, we, we've definitely seen an uptick, uptick in the uh, lunch the lunch meals. Um, we continue to receive and make available um, free breads and pastries from Weiss Markets and from Panera Bread, uh, as well as the food bags that we get um, every week from the York Benevolent Society. Uh, and we, we give those out to the families as they come in and get those meals. Um, under government commodities uh, for the year that just ended June 30th, uh, we received commodity food items for the year totaling $245,052, which is roughly 79% of our government allocation for last year. Um, we were unable to use the remaining balance of $63,927 due to the closure, uh, and it was subsequently reclaimed by the State Department of Agriculture, which is part of the program. Um, and then the last thing that I have is just startup wise, uh, we're scheduled to meet with our chief cooks on August 5th, uh, to prepare for the new school year. Um, and in addition to reviewing the new menus for the year, um, they will be compiling their opening food orders um, for, um, it was going to be an August 14th delivery, but we're going to end up pushing that back a week or two. And that's my report. Okay, Mr. Kamasik, and I myself too, after school starts up next month, uh, I will be getting with you too on a more personal level about my report. I know you've been doing a a uh, magnificent job so far during the summer and still feeding our kids over the summer period. So I thank you for all of that. Yes, ma'am, sounds good. Are there any remarks from the other board? Yes, this is Director Breland. Mr. Kamishak, I would just like to say your staff is very commendable for the work that they do with our children and their unwavering dedication to making sure that our children get fed and I just want to thank them for that. And the other thing I'd like to add is I know that Ferguson still gets their pastries from Wise's. And I know that some of the other people were asking, could they get some at their other schools? And I told them that the um, community and schools usually handle that piece. So I guess we have to coordinate with them to get that dispersed throughout the other schools, the other sites. Um, that's what my understanding is. And I can certainly look into that because I know we get some things from Panera Bread over at good but it doesn't come to the high school and obviously it doesn't go to ferguson so maybe just spread the wealth a little bit more yeah i know ferguson gets a lot of pastries and everything so hopefully if they can get some things to i know that some of the cooks are asking over at jackson for some okay. materials that they can help give to some of the families absolutely we can work on that we'll get that taken care of thank you this is director riviera i have a couple of questions um you, you stated that you're, we are serving 271 breakfasts and lunches on the four different sites, correct? That's correct. Which, could you uh, break it down and say which sites is actually serving the most? Which ones are doing, break it down and which sites are doing how much? How much are each site doing? Well, I'll um, give you an example. 
example for today, for example, the high school did 56 meals, lunches. Ferguson did 55. We did 34 at Ferguson and I think 34 at Jackson. So um, although Jackson came out of the gate stronger than anybody, they had a late start. But uh, the principal, Deanna Bowman, she just did a wonderful job of getting her teachers excited and getting outside. And obviously, Miss Sweeney was there too, helping support the effort. She's still in there every day, uh, giving us support, uh, cheering everybody on. But lately, Ferguson and, uh, and William Penn have been the stronger too. Okay, also, um, I, um, I, I'm, I live on the west side, right around the corner from Lincoln Charter. Okay, I have, um, we have, put it this way, students who are in this area that they don't have a meal household here. Their closest meal household that they would have to do is cross the bridge and go to William Penn Senior High School, or they would have to go out to Ferguson. Um, when doing meals, it should be beneficial to have a meal being provided in each area so the kids don't have to and the parents don't have to either struggle to get to where they're going to get a meal or not get a meal at all this is what i'm incurring over here on the west side these kids are not getting meals at all over here so well, um, i had to go get a meal you know i mean i did what i had to do because i'm looking out for my community and my children which um, which school would be the best uh, for Lincoln which school Charter. would be best? Lincoln Charter. Lincoln. Okay. Yeah. From what I hear, they give out a meal on Monday and a Thursday, a lunch Monday and Thursday. So tell me you're gonna feed somebody two days. They're not that's not feeding people. Well, yeah, I can certainly talk to somebody, but I know we don't handle their their food service program. I know, so. I know, I know, I know. That's why that's what I am saying. Um we're slacking in a lot of things. Is there a location mm -hmm. over there other than a school that we could provide the meals? Is there a place where we could provide them, Mrs. Riviera? Mrs. Riviera? <laughs> Excuse um, me, if I may, Ms. Riviera, if I yes. may, I'm sure if we would think about trying to give food over there, we could talk to that daycare center at Prentice Street Center. It's closed. They're not. The daycare's not open at all? No, COVID-19, baby. They're oh. closed up. Shut down for well, right now. That's what I'm saying. It's not, it's not everything if yeah. well, aren't the meals being provided at Jackson School? Yeah. Yes. Jackson's yes. on the other well, side. Isn't that, of the isn't, that that's on the, that's, isn't that close? A close no, proximity. I'm on the west no. side of town. I'm on I'm, no. I'm on the west side of town. I know, I know, I know about where you live, but Jackson's not that far away. Jackson is over on Jackson Street. I'm on Princess Street, the 400 block of West Princess Street, right around the corner from Lincoln Charter. Jackson's around the corner from Hannah Penn almost. All right, Ferguson almost would be the closest. William Penn is the closest. Yep, William Penn and Ferguson. Yeah. Well, Mark, let's look at let's look at if there's further references. Traffic. Let's look at if there's a geographic location um, for next summer. Um, yes, that, we can, that we can look at and if not maybe we have to take the show on the road and well and this summer is different from any other summer because right. we we weren't able to do the summer food service program mm -hmm. um which doesn't uh, that's the only one that lets us deliver meals the seamless supper option what we have right now doesn't allow us to to deliver meals um but they've allowed, allowed us to extend it through the 31st of august so in order to feed the kids that we do have, we thought it was the best option option for us. Oh, okay. I got another question also. Somebody said to me, do I have to pay $2 for a meal? So do we, do we charge adults $2 for their meals? No, um, last year we started a process where um, instead of having the adults take the, the, the kids meals, we told them that we would give them a meal for a dollar, but if they didn't have it, we would give them the meal anyway. No, I, I, I just asked because I was, that's what somebody said to me. And I'm like, right what? now, kids don't even need to be there to come in for the meals. We have adults coming in for five and six meals for their kids and we just give them to them. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I just uh, got a message from um, uh, Sandy Walker. 
she's saying that we can use her center on King and Salem. I also so got, I also got it. Yeah. So maybe in the future, then we can touch base with Ms. Walker and get that implemented to help serve our children. I also got a text message from a principal saying that there's a church on Salem and Hartley that um, that works with our school district anyway, and that might be another option. So it sounds like we may have some options. Yes. Yeah, last year we had 25 uh, remote sites that we supported with, but um, with the whole COVID thing, we weren't able to do that this year. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Kamizamek, this is Director Kennedy. I just have one question. Can you talk to us a little bit about how, if at all, um, the work for our um, meal service for students for in person this year is going to change and what that will look like? due to uh, COVID-19? Well, um, that's a great question. I, I've been meeting with my staff and talking to them. Um, we, we suspect that all the K-8s will definitely be eating in their classrooms. Um, and we kind of went through some, some different scenarios and the best one that we can come up with, which meets the children's needs as well as the district's needs is to um, have the, the students come down by classroom like they would normally eat lunch and then take their, their meals back. And I just happen to have one in one of these fancy free compartment um, containers like we're using for the summer lunch program. Uh, take it back to their classroom. Uh, we'll put a spork in there um, so that they can eat in their classroom. But uh, we found that the advantage of them doing this is um, they can get what they want, first of all. Um, it's offer versus serve. So if they go through the line and they don't like a tuna melt that day and they want the hot dog, they can get the hot dog because if we have to provide all the meals to the classrooms, it'll probably just be one main entree. Um, we also think that the meals will be hotter uh, because in our experience, even through summer, you know, when you're packing up 100, 150 meals, you know, they have a tendency to sit out open on the counter longer than you'd want and they have a tendency to cool down pretty quick. Um, and then uh, it uh, doesn't, doesn't require us to buy all the equipment that we would need to deliver the hot meals to the room. So there's some cost savings involved. Um, and then also we can check the kids off at the roster, which is an accountability issue for us. Uh, we can check them off at the register, um, just like uh, we do every day for lunch. So that's kind of what we're envisioning. We just started talks with the business office. And of course, I haven't had a chance to talk to the superintendent yet. Uh, but that's our thoughts right now, uh, as far as having no information to really go on till tonight. And then the second part, and thank you for that. And then the second part is, and, um, and this just popped in my head, um, and I don't know if there's been any discussion around it, but for those families who opt to do um, um, Bearcat um, online school, at, from home, are we still going to be offering those families meals at all or at in any way, I, I don't. I don't think we've done anything with the cyber students before. I know that they eat breakfast and lunch in the high school, anyways. The cyber students when they're in the high school doing their cyber classes, uh, but um, I don't think we've really, really even thought about um, observing people if they're if they're working from home. I guess there would be an opportunity for them to come in and take a meal out, possibly, but. That's what I was thinking, much like what, what, what we're doing now, but I was just thinking about, you know, for those who would, would, would be home, um, for those students and, and an opportunity to have a, uh, a, a breakfast and a lunch or just a lunch or something like that, particularly if, you know, some of our students will be having parents that will go, be going back to work and such too, but it's, it's just a thought. Yeah, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be able to do that. And we just had that conversation over at Ferguson the other day. And because I asked the cooks and they were talking about how that would be an easier option for those kids who are going to do cyber and it would take less manpower and it would be easier for them to put their meals together and keep them warm and have them pick, pick them up. That was a conversation that was just had last week. Uh, hello, this President Sweeney. Uh, Mark, is it possible? Can you look into that for us? 
to see how they would look at that because that sounds like that would be a great idea because well you be around when the kids come get their meals you see the look on their face and the parents and some of those people really need those meals absolutely absolutely i will definitely have an answer for you i'll get back to you very quickly with that thank you Director anything Orr? anything else thanks uh thanks mr kamasic for your report yes ma'am any other remarks directors dr barry Yes, ma'am. I just got a message that they are doing something in the West End starting next week. The um, the city is giving meals and activity packs at Bantz. Is it Bantz Park? B-A-N-Z-T? Yes, so that's yeah. starting next week. So We're, su we're supporting the parks um, starting tomorrow, actually. Okay. Three days, three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 180 meals. Your, the parks are open? Yes, uh, the park programs are starting tomorrow. Correct. We, we're, the meals are coming out of the high school. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Thank you for that information. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I got a, a text Mr. too about a church, a, a new church that just uh, opened up. Uh, Director Arletta, uh, it's over in your area, I'm told. Yes, ma'am. Church. Which one? The one up the street? The open church up on um, Princess and uh, what's that street? I'm assuming this is a church that's owned by uh, is owned by new people. Uh, they moved in last month. I'm told. Whoa. She said, "I'm told that you live right across the street." This is the, the one right here. Door open door. That's right the open door the street from the church. It done changed so many different times. This we got a new. It's, this is like the fourth fourth person that changed in a matter of a year and a half. So they're giving out meals. No. That's what the, well, that's what my text is saying. So they're going to start giving out meals. Yeah. Okay, I'm a, I'm gonna go there tomorrow and find out. Okay, okay. but Mr. Mark. Yes. Could you tell me what parks were servicing? And I can't, I'm sorry, off the top of my head, I could certainly get a message to you um, tomorrow morning. It's all, okay. it's the same parks that we do every single year with um, the York City Parks I, Department. I, ha I have the parks, Bantz, um, James E. Gross, Renaissance, Penn Park, Allen, and Al Albemarle, Albemarle. Albemarle. That's them. Yeah, yeah, we're doing 30 meals per park. And okay. the Gross Church is the formerly Lincoln Park out on um, Parkway Boulevard and Roosevelt. Okay. That one that one's not listed, Mr. Breland, but I thought I mean, you just I said have, Gross. I thought I you have, just said Gross. Is, is that yeah, what that that's is? the same same park? Okay. That's the same park. They changed the name. <laughs> it's the alias, okay. <laughs> yeah. Lincoln Park was the former name. Okay. I have the flyer. I'll see if I can get it to Jess and um, see if we can we can put it up. <laughs> Thank you. Is that everything, directors? If so, that concludes my report, Madam President. Thank you, Director Orr. Finance Committee, Director Riviere. Director Riviere, are you with yeah, us? I'm unmuted, right? Yeah, I'm muted. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, hello, everyone. Um, Finance Committee roll call. Everyone is here. Uh, if you want to look down for your items of discussion, we're looking at the uh, January, month of January for the um, financial report. Your ledgers, your receipt ledgers, and your depository ledgers. Did everybody go over these? And then we yes. have, okay. Uh, and your cash disbursements is going, 
from May the 4th to May the 31st needs to be approved. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you want to take a look, I went over, check your uh, disbursements. These are like, um, we're talking about 40 some pages that you should have previously um, looked over. That we want to make sure all of our bills are paid and everything is balanced. Does anybody have any questions or any remarks? This is Director Orr. Yes, ma'am. I received this uh, notice from our representative, Carol Hill Evans, and she sent out, because they were in session today, they're in session this week, and she sent out Bill SB 1125, and it's on a consideration. She's saying that it allows school districts by majority vote of the school board to extend the discount period and waive penalties for school district real estate taxes for the school year that begins on July 1st of this year. Okay. Now. So that's something we can discuss with uh, our acting uh, finance director. If Mr. Snodgrass, yeah, we can. Yes. Get with our yes on discussing that. My understanding of that legislation is that it, it allows the districts to do it. It does not mandate the districts to do it. Yeah, she says allow. She used that word allows school uh, district. Yeah. So uh, we, the tax bills are going out tomorrow uh, and they will be in uh, the residents' hands probably by the end of this week. Uh, we would have to communicate we can work with the uh, with Joe Jeffcoat, who's the uh, tax collector. Yes. This uh, legislation, is, if it's in the past, and, and how we can handle that. Uh, certainly, there has been discussion of this in the past, during the you know the initial days of COVID, you know March and April, and nothing was passed. So. Uh, um, we will certainly evaluate that as it's uh, in play once the legislation is passed. I can't hear him. I, yeah, he mumbled out. So we will discuss it with Joe Jeffcoat, who's the uh, the tax collector. The treasurer, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he collects the taxes on the district's behalf. Yes. He, we will talk with him once uh, once this legislation, if it's passed and signed by the governor, what the impact will be and how to communicate if there is a change that's corresponding to that. Okay. Yes, that was it for me. Yeah, and I'll work with you if you if you so desire with this, uh, Director Riviera. Thank you. Thank you, Director Orr, for that. Um, that's also just allows, if, if it is necessary, then we are able, we will be able to accomplish it. Correct? That's what that's for. Are there any other remarks? Does the superintendent have any remarks? No, ma'am. Okay, Madam President, that concludes the Finance Committee report. Thank you, Director Riviere. Next, we'll have our general policy report. Director Tom, Thompson Morgan, Thompson, Thomas Morgan is not with us today. Um, everyone's present. Did she give anybody her report to do? She did not, she didn't give it to me. This is Director War. She didn't give anything to me. And neither me. This is Director Kennedy. Okay. Well, 
you could you put the re the report on the screen general policies we have that up Ms. Sweeney, would you like me to talk about the policies? This is Ms. Thomas. Yes, I was asking to put it up on the, yes, you may. I well, was asking I mean, to put it so everyone knows. Well, they're lengthy, so I mean, they're there for you. Oh, no, we don't need to, the, yeah, I wanted the directors yeah. just to see what the policies are that's up for discussion. Yeah. They're there, they're there. So as, as usual, any policy changes we bring before the board are due to changes in the law and requirements from the Pennsylvania Department of, Department of Education. The first one, 805, is emergency preparedness and response. This comes from the Safe Schools Act and directly from the state of Pennsylvania. Um, the next one, 805.1, is relations with law enforcement agencies. Again, a direct result of Safe Schools Act and from PDE. And the last one is 808, and that deals with food services. And again, those changes are per Pennsylvania Department of Ed. So those policies are there for you guys to review. They've been reviewed by uh, Attorney Gettle. And if you have any questions, you can just send me an email, and I'll be glad to address them. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other any other remarks? Thank you. You're welcome. Any other remarks? Dr. Barry? No, ma'am. Okay. I believe that's we're at the end of our uh, that's all that I see on the agenda. Did I miss something? Okay, I would like to announce that the board did have an executive meeting 15 minutes prior to the board meeting, I mean the committee meeting, and we'll be leaving the committee meeting and going to an executive session to talk about personnel right after this meeting and we will not be reveen, reveen, coming back. So if there's no objections, at this time, I would like to dismiss the board to executive committee meeting. Any? Do we have a? Everybody have a link for the executive meeting? Yes. Was that e. oh, finance committee general policy? I think that was it. Yeah. So you are adjourning us into executive session, correct? Um, yes, I was waiting for the committee for the policy. I mean, uh, agenda. To, um, uh, yes, if there's no, no further discussion, is there any other discussions? Well, no, none being said, meetings adjourned.